We are ready to go. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we have another guest tonight, so you don't have to listen to me too much. Uh, our guest tonight is Hal Barwood. I'm really psyched to have him here uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, many of you uh, are RTF students and have asked me repeatedly, how does my skill set translate uh, over to video games? And I go, um, well, you know, I was an RTF student. I guess I, I don't know. Uh, Hal's actually worked on real movies. Uh, so he, he might have some insight into this, and uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, he's made some uh, remarkable games, which we'll talk about. And uh, he's one of the, uh, the more sophisticated thinkers about game stories, among other things, uh, around. I've heard him speak many times, and uh, he is far more eloquent than I am uh, in, in most ways <laughs> and, uh, about stories. Um, but uh, I want to I start by giving you a little bit of background uh, so he doesn't have to toot his own horn too much. Uh, this was my first encounter with Hal Barwood. He doesn't know this. He didn't know this was coming. Uh, back in the day, let's see, I was a sophomore in college. Um, and just so you don't think, I, I went to the net and downloaded this. This is my copy of the magazine that predated uh, Film Comment and uh, other American Film Institute publications. Um, actually, I guess this didn't predate Film Comment. But uh, this, was, this was a pretty special thing for me. And he's going to autograph it before he leaves. He doesn't know that yet. Um, but uh, this was uh, right around the time, well, right before Sugarland Express actually, uh, well, the interview was done before Sugarland Express actually shipped. Uh, and he was keeping pretty good company uh, even then. I mean, young Steven Spielberg, uh, Vilma Zygmunt, uh, amazing cinematographer. Uh, Matthew Robbins, one of his longtime, or his longtime uh, collaborator. Uh, and uh, that's him uh, over there on the left. So. Uh, we go back a long way, even though he didn't know it until just now. Um, so, um, you know, Sugarland Express, uh, uh, Spielberg's second movie and first non-TV film, I think. Uh, a remarkable movie, if you haven't seen it, uh, set in Texas. So, uh, so there's a Texas connection there. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars and Motor Kings, uh, directed by John Badham. He's worked with the best. Uh, MacArthur, which uh, if, if memory serves, I actually saw in Radio City Music Hall. I'm pretty sure I saw that on a giganto screen. Uh, loved it. Uh, worked uncredited on this, which I really want to talk about. That's kind of that's interesting, uh, potentially juicy. Uh, a guilty pleasure of mine, I admit. Um, I loved this movie. <laughs> uh, I, I saw this at North Cross Mall. Uh, and, uh, and, and absolutely loved it. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, Dragon Slayer, a moment of, of awe and reverence. Uh, this movie you know, pretty much changed my life and, in fact, uh, inspired uh, a project that may someday see the light of day for me. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Has anybody not seen Dragon Slayer in here? Oh, good God. You people, just leave the room now and go watch it. We got it right here. Let's forget the three hours of talking. Let's just watch the movie. Uh, and then uh, wrote, directed, and produced, warning sign, before making a leap that uh, is kind of the opposite of what many people in the video game business want to make. Hal moved from movies to video games. Uh, most people, uh, and I won't name names, uh, tried to move uh, from, from uh, video games to movies. It's very strange. So we'll talk about that. Uh, I want to talk about his, his earliest stuff. I couldn't even find any pictures of these. These are some amateur efforts. We're going to see some stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll find out why he, uh, he, he made some games before he was a professional and, and what that was all about. Uh, and then uh, uh, what is generally considered one of the, the best adventure games ever made, and, and many people think the best Indiana Jones game yet, uh, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, terrific game. Have some awards. Uh, so. So, uh, yeah, not, not too shabby. Uh, Big Sky Trooper. Uh, I have to admit, never played it. Don't know much about it. Hope to learn tonight. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, go, going from PC to Super Nintendo. Huh, okay. Uh, Rebel Saw 2 did uh, video, live-action video on that. Uh, I love this. I still have this on my desktop. Uh, Indiana Jones and Desktop Adventures. I uh, want to talk about how, how, how you go from epic to whatever the opposite of epic is. Uh, Yoda stories, I have to admit, I don't know much about this one either, so uh, we'll talk about that. 
Uh, worked on Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, kind of an action-oriented Indiana Jones game. Uh, and then uh, RTX Red Rock, which I guess we're going to see a little bit of here. And then on to Casual. I mean, this guy's done everything. I mean, movies large and small, games casual to, to epic. Uh, and most recently working on uh, an adventure game uh, with what sounds like some very interesting twists with a German company that I hope we can talk about. That's what makes games great right there on the left. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, uh, also uh, a, a uh, frequent speaker, teacher, critic, writer uh, in uh, various places. So uh, let's welcome Hal Barwick. And so we're going we're gonna to wander over there. Do you want me to wander over there? I want you to wander over there. Okay. Although while you're doing that, do this. while you're doing that, let's see, do I, I wonder if this will play. Oh God! I got all this cool stuff. Hold on, I'm 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 going to be a dweeb, and all these people will. Oh yeah, here we go. Let's see if this works. Is your audio plugged in, Warren? Oh no! Hold on. Silent movies are good. Oh no! Okay, fine. <laughs> they trust me with millions of dollars. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh my God. Yeah, we're we're prepared. We're professionals here. There's a distinct lack of volume. Hold on. Hold on. I, I'm really not kidding when I say this. I love this movie. It is a guilty pleasure and well worth watching. Okay, we're gonna start this over. If Mark Hamill knew as much about girls as he does about cars, dead he wouldn't be so nervous. If Annie Potts knew as much about cars as she does about boys, what are you doing? she wouldn't be so jealous. Motor on. And if you knew what they know about this customized metal flake Corvette, you'd be chasing it too. Hey, that's my car! Just stole my car! I'm helping you, dope. I'm helping you find your car. Together, they find love. I'm gonna be your first one. Excitement. <laughs> And danger on the trail of a stolen Corvette. Mark Hamill, back from Star Wars. And Annie Potts, <laughs> who's out of this world. In Corvette Summer. That's a terrific car. A fiberglass romance. Rated PG. <laughs> okay. Everybody has to go through a little public humiliation when they oh, come here. So. Uh, <laughs> I think we're done with that. All right. So... Um, just so you guys know, uh, some of the questions that you're going to hear, you're going to get here repeated every week because I think it's interesting to get uh, answers to the same questions from different people so we can get different perspectives. So don't be shocked by that. Uh, a bunch of these are, are new, so don't worry too much. Uh, so we're going to start with some of the, the, the old ones, uh, like uh, where are you from, literally and metaphorically? Uh, and how's that I come from? I, I was born and raised in Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, where Dartmouth College is. And the um, reason I got interested in movies, I think, is because my father ran the movie theater in this little college town. And I got exposed to a very wide variety of films when I was about five to ten years old. I was, you know, Citizen Kane is something, a memory for me from when I was just a tiny little kid. And um, so that's part of the explanation. I think there's, no one can ever really explain why they do anything. But there's certainly an influence there, and, and uh, it took off later in my life. Is, is there anything in, in your upbringing that you can look back on now and say, okay, this guy was clearly going to make movies? It sounds like making movies is obvious, but how about making games? Anyway? Yeah, making games, I think, is more significant. Um, I'm the youngest, by far, of uh, five kids. And uh, I had these domineering older uh, sisters and brother. And uh, our house is filled with board games and they would torture me by just defeating me and smashing me all the time without any mercy whatsoever. So eventually I got good at that and I got an interest in games as well at a very early age. But the reason why I couldn't go into games is because when I was growing up, computers were something that were in large buildings. They were large themselves. Men in white coats ran them and you had to have like engineering degrees in order to be allowed in the same room with them because they were all specially air conditioned and their false floors with these giant hanks of wiring running around. 
and I never even dreamed or hoped that I would ever get my hands on a computer, and I didn't think there was much of a career. I, I didn't even really understand that, that games kind of were um, designed and made by individual people. I just thought they were turned out the way you turn out, um, you know, revereware that you cook with. And so I didn't want to do that, and I thought movies would be more interesting. So in, in an interview you did uh, a while back, actually, you said you were designing games from the time you were a kid. What, yeah. What, what kind of games were you making? How did that um, happen? Well, the game that I did that was the most popular game among my friends was a, a, was a kind of a wooden box. It had a little perforated um, masonite top that was all inset into this frame. I had some power tools, and I cut this thing up and made it sort of nice. And it was just a bunch of wires, and on one side there were little switches for the defense, and on the other side there were little switches for the offense. It was a football game. And the idea was to be able to plug jacks into various open sockets, and you'd complete circuits. And, the, and without having to do anything um, other than run these jacks, you could um, uh, set up circuits, and then you could hit a little button. It was like one of those little funny doorbell buttons, and then a light would come on to say whether or not the play was successful or very successful or wasn't successful at all. And then you had to have an addition to this electrical part. You had to have a little game board where you could keep track of where the, the progression of the football was on the field. And my friends just would borrow that and take it home and play it endlessly. And I would play it with them sometimes, and they would have tournaments, and that was pretty hot. And then eventually, while I was kind of late in, in I, high school, I discovered I, what to this day still I think is the biggest revelation about games I've ever experienced, which was the inexhaustible depth of scissors, rock, paper. There, there is it's just, and, and, and I've been fascinated by that ever since, so I made a lot of scissors, rock, paper games. I made scissors, rock, paper uh, airplane dogfight games. I made scissors, rock, paper baseball games. I mean, oh my God. So, anyway. He's right. That's a really powerful idea. You, you'll hear a lot about that this semester before we're done, I suspect. Um, so how do you go from being a, a kid who's getting beaten up in board games by siblings to designing what sounds like remarkably sophisticated electronic gaming devices to school? What kind of education did you have? And yeah, well, I, I, I was a liberal arts high school kid. I, I did well in school, I have to say. and. Um, um, I was fascinated by the idea of robotics and, and entities that were other than us, um, namely, you know, that, uh, the idea that a computer could have its own, not, not consciousness exactly, but its own personality and confront you with it w was just fascinating to me. It still is. And, and so I got very, very interested in the fantasy of this sort of thing, even when I was not allowed to touch any of the actual hardware. That was why this thing was just maybe a little electrical circuits. So I would draw them all on graph paper, and it was fun. But uh, I was fascinated by that rather than by math or or, or um, science particularly. And so, d did you d uh, did you go right from? I mean, did you go to college knowing you were going to make movies or thinking no, you were going to no, be an engineer? No, uh, no, no. Um, I went to college. Um, f well, actually, well, I was admitted. I went to Brown University as an undergraduate uh, student. And I, I went in, I was going to go into the engineering department. And after about one, actually before I ever got there, I just realized that, you know, I can do that uh, linear algebra stuff a little bit. And I can sort of do a little calculus, but I'm just not going to have the chops to be good at this. And the moment I got to school, I stopped doing that. And I, um, I got interested in uh, um, painting and drawing and graphic design, and that's really h how I went. Um, Brown University is up on top of a little hill on the east side of town, and about halfway down the hill is Rhode Island School of Design, a very famous art school. And they have a reciprocal program, so I also got ap applied and got admitted to the Rhode Island School of Design, and I took courses down there as well. And so, and that was really your, your start in film. You were, you were an animator, yeah. I understand. Yeah. What, what was that? How did you get into animation? What sort of stuff did you do? Uh, well, I did these weird little puppet animation movies that the puppets are made out of little cells. So, and they have little, like, little sticky stuff on the back, and you kind of sit underneath an animation crane, and you, with your little tweezers, you move them around, and then take a picture, and you move them around and take a picture, and I did a whole bunch of movies like that. Letting Ray Harryhausen, there you go. Yeah, kind of, it's a two-dimensional. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 
how did you how did you go from Brown? To, what, what happened when you went from Brown to Hollywood? I mean, that's well, that's a pretty big jump. Well, I mean, it, it, what's, it, what's really interesting is that I, it happened for me at a lucky node. Uh, I, I did really well in, in college. Um, you know, I was a, sort of an ace, and um, I just all my friends were going to go to graduate school, and I was just going to go hit the hit the bricks and see what I could find for a, a job to somewhere in Boston, probably or something like that. And I really didn't have any ideas. And about a year and a half before um, I finished school, I'm, I fell in with some RISD kids who were interested in movies. And they had little eight millimeter cameras and we'd go and we'd shoot uh, like the Boston Transit uh, Agency. We'd, we'd do documentaries, uh, kind of like of, you know, what it's like to, just little impressionistic documentaries about, you know, like the MTA. And, and stuff like that. And I started to get interested in this sort of thing. I, I got interested in cutting movies together and seeing how images work together. And I realized that that was a form of graphics in effect, you know, that, that there was something about a succession of images which was a little bit like um, just designing, you know, a letterhead. And um, so I got interested. And then <coughs> I discovered, luckily, one of my art teachers uh, uh, knew uh, James Ivory, the director. And James Ivory went to school at USC Film School, um, the, 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 the greatest film school in the world. And um, so he said, hey, you know, why don't you apply there? And I did. And this was in the early 60s, before people stopped wanting to write the great American novel and started to want to write, to, to direct the great American movie. So I wrote off an application. And because I had a good record, I got a fellowship to go to USC. So I just, hey, this is great. And my childhood sweetheart and I um, got married and came to California. So that was it. It was just a wonderful opportunity. Um, and that solidified my idea of going to the movies. And you were in a, a class or, or a cohort that, that had some pretty impressive yeah. folks in it. Um, yeah, I did. Um, all, all, my, all my adult friends really come from that uh, experience. Um, Walter Murch, famous film editor, um, sound designer, invented sound design, Ben Burt. Um, uh, Matthew Ramos and, and uh, Caleb Deschanel and uh, uh, George Lucas. Uh, George is an old friend of mine. He's uh, you know, all these. Steve Spielberg was not part of this group. He did not go to film school. He was one of those guys who, when he was f 10 years old, knew he wanted to be a movie director and did everything he could to get there. So by the time he got to college, he really didn't need to take any courses. So uh, you and you and Matthew Robbins uh, established a. A collaboration, a partnership, seems like pretty early on. Yeah. Um, How did that? Happen? After we got out of film school, um, I went off and uh, did a went to work for a little company. Nowadays, they'd be the kind of company that does multimedia presentations in kiosks. But in those days, it was called industrial films, <laughs> and we would do films for like Boeing and for the Air Force, and sometimes for NASA. These sort of science-oriented or technically oriented um, training movies, really. And and so I was doing that for a couple of years. Uh, Matthew went off to the AFI after his stint in film school and went to film school again. And then we both met up um, uh, kind of cutting commercials at um, uh, Cal Bernstein's operation. Uh, Haskell Wexler, a famous cinematographer, and Cal Bernstein, a famous fashion photographer, jointly owned a company called Dove Films, and they made commercials. Um, this, how long ago was this? This is so long ago that you know, Schlitz beer was something that people thought of. And, and, and so they would do these commercials, and I would help cut them. And Matthew and I you know, f hooked up again because we both worked at, at that company. And we would take lunch hours and go think up movies to write. And we actually decided, you know, this, we actually might be able to do this. Why, why, don't we, why, are we, why are we cutting commercials? Let's just go write. So, so we did for um, 15 years. And, and it sounded, uh, I mean, in, in interviews you did back, back in the day, it sounded like you had a kind of a, a strange process where I mean, you didn't sort of trade pages back and forth or scenes no, back and forth. We, you worked in a very unique sort of way. It took us eight shots to get a movie made. Um, we wrote seven scripts, scripts before Sugarland, And um, the first one we wrote, which was just god awful, um, it was about a, a motorcycle racer and, and who discovers a, a drug running operation. This is back in the six, uh, early 70s. And, um, what we did is we sat down together, and be, because working in a collaboration in a, as, as a writer is a little bit like being in a three-legged race. You, know, you, you can make it work, but you have to pay a lot more attention to how things get done than you do if you're all by yourself. So um, Matthew and I would sit down with a bulletin board, and we'd tack up these three-by-five cards with all headlines of what, what we thought all the scenes were. 
And our method of working was to just, you know, scenes we'd like to see. We just, uh, this, here's kind of this overall cloud of movie ideas. And in amongst those ideas, hey, there's a scene right here where X does Y to Z and put that up. And then after a while, you say, well, that's kind of a second act thing. That's rising action. And over here is something that could introduce the movie. And here's another one that could be sort of toward the climactic part of the movie. And we, gradually this thing would sort of take shape. And then we, 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 we learned how to do that. And then we would run off and do our own stuff and come back and hate each other. <laughs> so we never did that again. We were, this, the reason why our collaboration survived is we stayed in the same room and we would pace the room and we would sit down and we'd write some stuff and we'd pace and we'd talk and we'd write and we turned out the pages jointly from there on and it worked great and we, we did a lot of stuff. So uh, <coughs> we're going to jump around a little bit because I want to pursue that a little bit further. That, that process sounds very close to what I'm doing right now on a game project, ah. and I've I've never tried it before. The the, the cards and having spe you know specific beats called out is that something? Th it sounds like you're you're. It's you're pretty ordinary, I think, for people to do it. Okay, so is that something that you? There's done even a program. A the same guys that do final um, uh, final draft make a little uh, uh, three by five card program that you can really? you can get. Yeah, I use final draft too. I didn't know yeah, they had yeah. a three by five. I, I, they may not be. They may not have taken it past system nine. I'm not sure. Huh. Okay, um, so uh, on, on Circle Land Express, uh, what was it about that one? How'd you get the gig, and what was it about that one that well, the other <coughs> first seven didn't have? And the tragedy of movies is that your best ones don't always get done. And uh, you'll see a, a, a back screen background, which is um, one of Ralph McQuarrie, very famous illustrator, did a lot of uh, uh, production design and con concept design for Star Wars originally. I introduced that guy to George. And the reason I, I did is that when I was doing my industrial films, I met Ralph when he was working for the Boeing Company in Seattle. And then eventually he came to LA and I kept track of him. And um, Matthew and I had written a science fiction script um, for the uh, producer Larry Tucker, and um, writer producer. And we all were on the verge of getting it made. And Larry was busy pulling people in who might be able to direct it. And there's this young hotshot guy who had been directing some TV series, uh, um, very young, who, who came for an interview. He had really long hair, and, and uh, it was Steven Spielberg. And that was how we met. So now the clock goes forward a couple of years. Now we're friends. And um, um, suddenly Steve had this news item from uh, a, a, a police chase that happened um, uh, sort of between the Louisiana border and Houston. And uh, it was a hijacking of a police car. So he thought he could, we could turn that into a, a, a movie, sort of loosely, very loosely based on fact. And so we did. The reason it's loosely based on fact is that the real events are so horrific and unendurable that you just can't even th really think about them very hard without just wanting to kill yourself. So um, we Hollywoodized it shamelessly, and I'm still glad we did. So. Um Matthew Robbins said in, in, in an interview in that magazine, actually, that uh, the first thing you did on Sugarland Express was uh, to create an advertisement for the movie, you know, full of hot lines. Well, we, did, we did try to do stuff like that. I, I, think I feel that, like I think I'm still that's, doing that. I think that's still now. a good thing you should be doing, because yeah. otherwise you don't understand your premise. If you can't understand the part of your premise which is going to put seats in the theater, then you're not making the right game. So okay, so something that's still applies. and I have to say, there's some games that I've made since that day where I, I wish I'd been a little more careful about the hot lines. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think we can all say that. Um, so, uh, boy, you know, I'm tempted to, to sit here and talk about movies all day, but I, we, sh we should probably move on. Um, from from Sugarland Express uh, to Bingo Long Traveling All Stars and Motor Kings. Um, so, from rip from the headlines, you know sort of action chase movie to baseball movie w about black barnstorming baseball players? Um, How does that happen? Well, the movie business is, is small. It's largely, to this day, based in Los Angeles. And so if you're swimming around in the, the cesspool that is Hollywood, <laughs> you meet a lot of people. And one of the people that I met was a guy named Rob Cohen. And Rob, in those days, was an executive. He's since become a director. Fast and the Furious is Rob's movie. Um, for Motown, who was trying to move into the movie business. That's kind of a real version of, the, of um, Dreamgirls. And um, 
Rob was kind of leading the pack, and they were they were looking for a material that could be uh, you, you know have black stars and 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 appeal to a black audience. And William Brashler, a guy in Chicago, had written this wonderful book about um, black baseball players before the color line was breached, and um, Rob asked us to adapt it, and we did. did so it's the one one adaptation. Uh, so was was the book enough? Reference material for you? Did you go look at oh, Satchel no, Page no, no, and no, no, no. Josh Gibson you, and all that stuff? You just you read a pile of stuff. Suddenly, suddenly your suddenly your life is turned into. This is before the internet, so yeah, a lot of actual books, you know, <laughs> piling up on your desk and notes and three by five cards and confusion. Uh, I, I can only imagine how much research went into MacArthur. And we spent a year researching MacArthur before we put before we did the first, uh, you know, fade in. That's that's an amazing luxury. I mean, did, was that typical, or was was no, that a new experience for you? No, it was. We needed to do it because it was a, one of those movies that really had to trade on being reasonably factual. And we, the other problem is that we were following up on Patton, and uh, Patton was a very very colorful f character. And I've since learned not as important to the war effort as the movie might make you believe. But MacArthur um, was a very dry, spare, remote character who was like a generation older than all the other uh, commanding generals in the army. He, he, he's one of those guys that got in, he was a year or two older than Eisenhower and the other guys, Patton and so forth, and um, Marshall, and, and um, he went to West Point and then in the First World War he got promoted to general before the war ended. He became a brigadier general in the First World War. And so as a result, he and the other guys didn't, they were still like majors. So. You know, he went through with this um, kind of his career was over really um, before the first, the Second World War started. He was he had retired and he was brought back out of retirement during the Second World War and then stayed out of retirement until Truman fired him in Korea. But he was an old man by then; he was in the 70s. So, looking looking at at the career up to this point, it's it seems like the movies are getting a little bit bigger and MacArthur seems pretty big, and then all of a sudden there's Close Encounters uncredited. Well, um, I have to understand that I wrote about three dozen screenplays and m m about 30 of those with my partner Matthew, and of that number, only six emerged with my name on them. And I don't um, say that in order to sound like, um, gee, I had a lot of trouble because that's quite typical. In fact, my batting average is probably better than average. Um, Danny Rubin, who wrote one of the most wonderful movies ever made, Groundhog Day, has never ever had any other thing ever made, and which is sort of a tragedy. So we did pretty well. And um, Close Encounters is a, a movie we were asked to write. Um, Matthew and I wanted to do our own stuff, and we didn't really want Close Encounters to get made, but Steve was a friend. And so er, we were trying to get this other movie made, and we didn't want to get involved. And in particular, um, we didn't want Steve to have uh, Rick Dreyfus get on the ship. The problem is that Steve had a gigantic hit in um, Jaws, so there's just no stopping that guy. And we, were, we just weren't going to get our movie made. So although we, we declined to write the movie with Steve bef when it got going, originally, um, he eventually had a draft done by Paul Schrader, and it was just awful. It was sort of a a, a, a serious version of Men in Black with these, you know, you know steely-eyed Air Force guys and just totally soulless. And it was no good and it was rejected. And then he had another guy sort of work on it and it was no good. So he eventually said, damn it, and he sat down and he did it. Steve's a rather accomplished writer. And he, he did a version and it was good, but it had all sorts of horrible problems in it. And we were, by now we've moved to Northern California and I live now where I have, where I lived then where I do now in, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area and we were on the phone all the time with this guy and then suddenly he said, hey, I've got a green light, I'm going to go make this movie. Oh, God, Steve, you can't do that. Here's what's wrong, A, B, C, D, E, F. He said, yeah, you're right, you're right, come on down. And so we came down and we lived at his house for about a week or two and then we just did a whole bunch of stuff on that movie, uh, huge things. For example, I'll just give you a few examples, that, that inf deep things that inform the movie. Um, it, as it happened, uh, quite a few years previously, I had been touring the country and with my family, and I visited Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And the reason why Devil's Tower is in that movie, because I said, hey, Steve, you want a mystical place to bring this ship down? I've been to this place up in Wyoming called Devil's Tower. Hey, let's do it. So that's, that's, that's where that's it, that came from. The young kid, uh, um, Barry, um, 
is in the movie because Matthew and I wanted him there. Uh, there was a big problem in that movie. Um, the climax is a, a, a moment of wonder and awe, but there is no dramatic resolution. You know, you're, you're there, here's the, here's the, the, the giant um, volcanic plug, and here comes this amazing glittering light-filled ship to come down and fill you all with awe, but there is no drama. So what are you going to do? And our idea of putting drama in was to have the other obsessed person, Melinda Dillon, have a child who was kidnapped at the beginning, and the dramatic thing, the resolution, is he comes back. So we did that. Uh, the mashed potato scene, all that stuff, that's me. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, all that stuff. You know, there's just a lot of stuff in there that we did. The whole thing of rolling the, rolling the globe down the hall and the latitude and longitude, all that stuff. The, the scene where the, the Air Force uh, comes and the citizenry um, you know, claims they've seen flying saucers and they're almost getting the better of the Air Force guy and then Robert's Blossom says, ah, I saw Bigfoot once and ruins everything. That's, that's, that's our scene too. So there's, just, there's quite a lot of material in there and a lot of it is structural, um, how to organize the movie and uh, um, once you have Devil's Tower, now you can do a physical climax where you have to climb up there and, and you know, defeat the, the guys that are trying to get you with the sleep gas so forth. So it, was it a, a writer's guild thing that, that, that goes uncredited or is that typical? Uh, well, put films? it this way. Uh -oh. Don't contest my credit, guys. You have a percentage of the movie and you get to come off the ship. <laughs> and so I put my kids to college, so you know, through <laughs> by this, so I, I'm not too unhappy. Okay. And everybody knows about it on IMDB, I'm listed, you know, so everyone knows we did it. So I feel well, pretty good. And it, and it set you up for Corvette Summer. Yes. A year later. Yes. Actually, we were working. We were we were still shooting chunks of of that move of um, Close Encounters while we were busy preparing uh, Corvette Summer. S uh, Steve had uh, had a huge success with a preview on Jaws, and they all wanted him to do the same thing. And he came down somewhere in Texas, but it wasn't here. Maybe Dallas, and um, do a preview of Close Encounters, and it did not go so so well got very nervous and a lot of stuff got shot after principal photography. We just, he, was, he was shooting for months uh, up until it was just about released. Wow. Um, so Corvette Summer, <laughs> I can't, I, I'm obsessed about the movie, I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you off the hook. <laughs> Corvette Summer and Dragon Slayer, man. Well, uh, I, 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 I promised myself and my wife that I wasn't going to goober, but um, <laughs> I you know, I mean, we the idea that someone is... Um, you know, f uh, interested in Corvus Summer is so flattering that I, I don't know how to respond to any of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, luckily we only have three hours. Um, <laughs> so uh, this one, okay, just where to begin. Uh, you, were, you were the writer with Matthew Robbins on this, and yeah. you produced Matthew and directed. Robbins directed yeah. it. How did you decide which roles were going to be played by, by it, it goes back to a film school, really. Um, my dreams of directing were suppressed because I, I really never took the actual directing course at USC. I was very interested in uh, animation. I was pursuing that. I pursued it professionally for a while before Matthew and I started writing together. And um, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't fully conscious of my desire to actually step behind the camera and direct. But Matthew had gone to film school expressly for that purpose, and there was no doubt that what was going to happen if we got going. He would direct and I would produce. And it was a way of protecting each other. I mean, I, he just knew a lot more about how to do that sort of thing than I did at that moment. And um, uh, I was perfectly willing to, I have enough of a head on my shoulders so I can sort of keep track of goods and services. So, okay, I'm the producer. So that's how we did it. And uh, how, how did, how did uh, uh, Mark Hamill get involved in this? All right. It seems now, like an odd thing for him to do career-wise. It's seems like an odd, odd it's, casting it's in the movie. Odd, it's odd every way you can think about it. Um, here's what happened. It's an original. We wanted to do, it was a teenage quest movie, um, a coming-of-age movie, and um, it, was, it was very brutal, the, the first versions of it. It was r rather realistic. And uh, the Vanessa character was pretty down and dirty. And our idea of casting was a, a guy you almost don't even know about anymore, a guy named Don John Savage, who was this very serious kind of um, actor studio, sort of gritty uh, uh, Broadway actor with a bit of a film career. And uh, it was going to be a kind of a rough and tough movie. But the studio got nervous about that. 
And not only that, but um, of course we knew Mark through um, George. So we, 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 met, we had met him. And we had seen a TV show, uh, a, movie, a TV movie that Mark Hamill and John Savage did together when they played brothers. John Savage uh, uh, comes down with some terrible, terribly uh, swift cancer. And it's the relationship between the two brothers. And we, we watched this TV movie and we said, you know, that kid Hamill is really good in this thing. And he's more interesting than John Savage. So we, we cast Mark. But what we didn't really quite understand when we cast him was that Mark is very good, or was then anyway. Uh, but he, his persona, what he's made of inside, and how he comes across on the screen lightened the movie enormously. And we just could, he just couldn't have Mark Hamill going through the agony that we were going to put John Savage through. So the, the movie lightened up and became more of a romantic comedy. And that's really what happened. And the very last, I've had some bad luck with titles, and Corvette Summer is one of them. Um, we made this movie for MGM, and it was called Stingray, and uh, with a little bit of uh, idea behind the sting part of the Stingray. And um, everything was great, but at the last minute, some St. Louis fly-by-night movie company found out that we were in production and thought for some reason that we were going to make this big hit movie. And they were going to um, sort of do this low-rent movie about stolen cars um, and call it Stingray and get out before we did. And, well, the rule and you can't, you can't copyright a title. They're not copyrightable. All you can do is have first issue. So if they actually got out there first, we weren't going to be able to use that title. And instead of trying to get the lawyers at, for MGM to put the clamps on this guy, they just caved and said, ah, we'll find another title. So one day we came to work and found out it was called Corvette Summer, and we just about jumped off the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I just about wrote my dissertation on that, uh, actually. Wow. I was, was going to write about coming-of-age movies, and it's, it's an underappreciated movie you should watch. Uh, and speaking of not particularly underappreciated movies, but uh, uh, Dragon Slayer, um, we don't even have to talk about it. Other than for me to say, I mean, we can actually. No, I'll show you. But uh, if you want. I mean, as a, as a fantasy fan, and as a, I mean, I'm doing what I'm doing because of Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and Ray Harryhausen. Ray Harryhausen, all right. And his, his acolytes worked on my movie. When I, we're going to talk about that. Okay, fine. You're on the hook to talk. Um, I mean, there was there's a scene in this movie for those of you who haven't seen it where the the Peter McNichol in a bizarro, because now I think of him as the biscuit, and I can't think of him as anything but the biscuit. <laughs> Me neither. Uh, but at the time, he was he was a pretty reasonable, sort of light, action comedy sort of hero. And he's, he's running through a cave, and a real dragon pursued him. And I wondered where the real dragon came from. I mean, I knew it wasn't a real dragon, okay, just to be fair. But um, it was, I mean, real, the, the acting is terrific, the story is terrific, it's got some meat. Uh, about, I mean, there's stuff going on about religion and, and, yeah. and oppression and superstition and... and I remember we yeah. grew up, we, we, we were starting out in the 70s when we had, not quite as wonderful as our current president, but uh, one pretty right up there, Richard Nixon. And uh, so we were doing a Nixonian dragon story. Uh, it, it, the depth is there. Um, and uh, the, the, the effects, I mean, are just... They're over the top, incredible. Now, I mean, people see uh, CGI ev every day, and so it probably doesn't have the same impact. But at the all time, I could say is, I wish we had CGI. <laughs> oh man, you think that stars are troublesome and, and uh, um, recalcitrant? You know, staying in their trailer and causing you to lose all the time on the set and so forth. And it's true that actors every now and then can be badly behaved, and some are famous for, for being that. That nothing is as badly behaved as a rubber dragon. <laughs> <laughs> My God. So anyway, um, you don't have to have rubber dragons anymore. That's definitely good. I have hanging the mats the work right automatically. You don't have to worry about that anymore. It's, that's wonderful. Um, everything is done in Photoshop or su uh, super versions thereof, and uh, it's just it's just a marvelous thing. Um, the other thing that's going on is that if you look at uh, George's, the last, uh, it's not quite true of episode one, but episodes two and three of Star Wars, the two last Star Wars movies, which were shot digitally, um, as well as became uh, digital uh, projection versions, um, both of those movies are 100% special effects movies. Every single thing about them has gone through the ILM mill. Now, in the days of, of uh, first Star Wars, of course, that wasn't true, and I think George had 
three or four hundred shots, I guess, or something like that. It's not that much. Out of two thousand cuts in the movie, or maybe maybe three thousand cuts, there's probably five or six hundred that are that are special effects. And he invented ILM for the purpose. Um, we had about 160 shots total in Dragon Slayer. That's all we could afford to, to do on a, about a $20 million movie, which was very expensive in its day. Nowadays, stuff is like that is reasonably cheap once you get rolling and make the models. And my god, we just would have gone nuts. Well, it's a terrific movie. Go motion is amazing. Wow, um, thanks. The, the stuff of blurring between, yeah, you know, and, uh, and stop motion is. We had a little computer and and uh, the 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 not the flying dragon, but the walking dragon um, had little armatures which have been since you know removed with Photoshop techniques. Um, and uh, what would happen is Phil Tippett would um, get the dragon into his position and then back up a frame. And then you open the camera um, aperture while the dragon gets to the next position. So there's blurring uh, in the direction of motion. Now, in, in real life, unless things are going really, really fast, you don't have blurring in the direction of motion. But in a movie, if you've ever looked at frames of film, it, it, it's amazing that how unlike still photographs movies are. In a still photograph, everything is generally, unless you're being very arty, uh, you know, super sharp. But in a movie, almost nothing is ever sharp. Only parts of the frame are sharp in any given frame. And over a, a period of time, your mind kind of integrates it all, and it becomes sharp in your head. But when a person makes a gesture like that, and you look at the frame that that gesture is on, it's just a blur. It's just a streak. And people are used to seeing these this staccato burst of images one after another being connected by these blurs, so that this, this part of my gesture is connected over there by this sweep. And you have to worry about this when you're doing animation. So that, for example, in classical Disney animation, you often get what are called strobes, where someone would do that um, same gesture and it would go tick, 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 tick. And you, you'd watch it. You'd see like three arms as you'd watch a gesture like that. Go take a look at some of the older movies. If you look at a lot of Disney movies from, from you know, the 40s and so forth, most of these movies, uh, a lot of this stuff can be shot on what's called twos, where you have a character and you take two frames, and then you move them and you take two more you know, when you're drawing. Um, but whenever big motion would happen, everything would be done on ones, so that you'd have as many items as you could. And then sometimes, um, if they were really important scenes, and they really had to make sure they seemed fluid, the inking and painting would be done in such a way as to actually produce those blurs. And we could just do it with a little computerized system. It was pretty neat. And up until the era of CGI, that was a big part of uh, the repertory of, of ILM to, to, to do creatures. Groundbreaking stuff. Um, and then, from there, warning sign, where you did direct. So why yep. the decision to direct at that point? I wanted to direct. I, I decided finally I wanted to direct, and it cured me. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, that was my next question. Um, and uh, I, I have to admit, I haven't seen the film. But oh, I, actually, I'm actually I'm rather proud of it. It's nice. It's got a very nice DVD. Um, that was the, the guys who do Anchor Bay are just wonderful people. They were extremely good to me, much bit nicer than the, the, the Dragon Slayer DVD. Paramount could care less. But Anchor Bay did a great job. They would just they cleaned up all the dirt off the negative. They just retimed it all to the way I wanted it because the old videotape was no good, and they were just terrific. Anyway, um, the, the themes seem right up to the minute. I mean, you were you were 20 years ahead of your time. Uh, that? I wish that I'd had the kind of money um, that the Dustin Hoffman um, uh, Rene Russo movie. What the heck is the name of that Outbreak. thing? Outbreak. Outbreak. I wish they'd had their money. That was like a 50 million dollar movie. Mine mm -hmm. was made for. Five, ah. so I can't even make a game for that anymore. I know, um, but it's it's uh, it's a film about biological contamination, and yeah. it, 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 it all takes place in a in a, a facility in the middle of Utah, where all the people that are locally there think they're doing uh, research into uh, genetically engineered uh, crops, but instead they're they're um, they're researching biological agents that make people crazy. And such agents actually do exist. They're the diseases of horses that, that, that do that. And uh, the idea is to not only kill your enemy, but demoralize them in the process. And what happens in the story is that the, the heroine is a, the security guard in this place. And she's the one who actually pulls the trigger and shuts the whole place down so no bugs can get out when there's an accident at the very beginning of the film. Her husband is the uh, local sheriff. And he, uh, the whole story is how he's trying to you know, get her out alive. Well, I, I ordered it. It didn't come in time for me to see it ah. before you got here. I'm going to watch it. We'll run a trailer. Okay. Um, 
So uh, one more one more film question, and then we'll get to games. I promise. Uh, this is the, the the film geek in me is coming out. I apologize. Uh, in that 74 AFI interview, uh, you and, and Matthew Robbins talked about an idea that you were working on called Clearwater. Do you yeah, remember? yeah. Oh, gee. Holy cow. I, I mean, can, can I, let me read the description here for, the, for these guys, okay? It's a story about the future when the world is pretty much depopulated up in the North Woods, the Pacific Northwest. A bunch of bandits figure out how to put a steam locomotive back together. They put it on the rusty rails and go out and explore. Damn, I want to make that game. Did well, you ever think about that? What well, here's the, the thing. I mean, that, why isn't that the, a game? The, the, best, the best way to describe that movie is 10 years before Road Warrior, it was Road Warrior with a locomotive. And I Which sounds I, cooler than Road Warrior with a... Well, a, Road Warrior is one of my car. favorite movies <laughs> of all time, so um, probably the reason is that, I, that Clearwater was going, to, was going to be that movie but, but about 10 years earlier, and it almost got made. Um, we had... It was at Universal. They actually made posters, and... Um, so they, they were doing kind of a, a, a thing for exhibitors, and they had these posters of all the movies they were going to make. And we, they had one for us. This was kind of funny. But instead of the budget, which we needed to get down to 2.7 million, oh my God. it was about 2.8, and they canceled it. <clears throat> okay. The Fools. It, well, it, it sounds like it would have been a great movie. And, it, and, and like I said, it just sounds like a perfect setting for a game, too. Um, I think it's a good one. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll 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 talk. Maybe I can get Disney to do the movie and the. Uh, and there the you game. go. All right. Um, it's been enough time now. We can do another Road Warrior. Let's that's go. True. <laughs> that's true. No no blood or smoking, but we'll, anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, you said uh, uh, this is a quote. After a while, digits became more attractive than sprockets, and now I'm a game guy. Yeah. So that's literally how true. did that transition happen? Here's, what, here's what really happened. Well, here's what really yeah. happened. Um, this was uh, the, 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 there was an actual epiphany moment, and the moment happened on the set of the movie Dragon Slayer. This is all happening in 1980, so personal computers now exist, although I didn't personally own one in 1980. And um, we were in uh, suburban London, uh, a very expensive place to live then and now. I think the pound is over $2 these days. It was 2.35 when we were there. And we needed to shoot uh, an Iron Age village, and we needed to do it in London. This is not an easy thing to do in a, one of the world's most urbanized <laughs> localities. But there was a place called Stalker's Farm just outside of the city where we could have basically 360 view and just see trees and um, fields. Okay, so we built a, a village with thatched huts and everything there and uh, stage a bunch of scenes. We, we burned the thing to the ground with a dragon flying over in the middle of the night. We did dances. Um, there's a whole sequence there where Caitlin Clark is revealed to be a girl and not a boy um, so that she's going to avoid the, the, the dragon lottery. Um, uh, the, the, the Ian McDormand character, who later became uh, famous in Star Wars as the Emperor, um, uh, is a Christian uh, missionary trying to convert all these people. and. You know, uh, uh, if we pray, the dragon will go away, that sort of thing. And, um, and then the uh, evil minions of the king come in to uh, wreck havoc when it's all done. And this is really elaborate. So there's a celebration, and, there's, and they think they've gotten rid of the dragon, and there's all this dancing. There's hundreds of people dressed in burlap, and you have to make sure they don't have running shoes and wristwatches on, you know, because this is the Iron Age and so on and so forth. And so this is really elaborate uh, a bit of production. I, I was um, uh, in a, in a state of incredible stress and anxiety. It turned out that um, a character named Tyrion in the movie, um, John Hallam, had uh, thought he missed his call sheet, and he thought he was off for a few days, and he was on a boat to Ireland, and we had to literally, you know, fly him back at the, you know, meet him at the dock and fly him back because he was working that night. <laughs> Just horrendous. And um, so all this is going on, and, and Derek Van Lint has got these huge towers where he's going to produce moonlight with these gigantic arc lights. And um, there's a choreographer there teaching these very quaint dance steps to um, the pagan population. And once I had gotten all the goods and services there, once the thatch was on the huts, once the gasoline was at the ready, uh, once Derek's towers were up and the lights were going on, I found that I had no interest in watching Matthew work. And instead, I wandered off the set and to my little trailer, I had an HP 41C calculator, which was the first calculator that actually would do letters as well as numbers. 
And I taught that calculator while Matthew's off directing the movie, uh, which is dear to my heart. Um, and nevertheless, I found it more interesting to sit alone in a room and program my HP 41C calculator to play Hunt the Wumpus. And I realized if that were really true, I was in the wrong business. Man. And that began a transition that took me 10 years to complete, but I, I did it. That was, that was like the day I sat at TSR with a 20-sided die and percentile dice in my hand and went, if this is the biggest decision I have to make, I'm in the wrong business. You know? <laughs> and I knew I had to make video games. Um, you know what occurs to me? We have some video footage of this. Mm -hmm. we, have, we, should, we should show these guys who haven't seen Dragon Slayer a little okay. bit of Dragon Slayer before we keep going. Give them a little break from us talking. All right. Shall so we do it? Why don't we, why don't we do that? Do you want to do it on your yeah, machine? Because you already got it in there. Well, yeah. Great. So now I think we're ready to head into the world of, uh, of video games. So let's start, whoa, with me tripping over the cord again. We really need to go wireless around here, you know? Um, so you're, you're in your trailer programming your HP calculator. Yep. While Matthew Robbins is killing dragons and, and having other people take credit for it. Um, so how did, it's seven years, six years, five years? How long was it before you actually got a job? And what happened That's during 1980, those five years? and 10 years later, I went to work for LucasArts. So, right, okay. And the reason is that I still, uh, and, and sadly for me, I was unable to understand that I should just do everything possible to get in the game world because had I done so, a game that maybe I'll show you a little bit of uh, later uh, might have gone on to become a minor hit in the days when the Apple II ruled the world. But instead, I did a big chunk of that game, but then I made warning sign in the middle of it all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that slowed me down. And by the time I got back to um, my little Apple II game, uh, the Apple II uh, phase of life had vanished. And uh, so I was writing screenplays. And uh, as had happened previously, I had had some that didn't sell and weren't getting made. And a phone call came in from LucasArts. In those days, it was called uh, Lucasfilm Games. And they wanted someone to do um, a follow-up to uh, a hit game they had done, which was the adventure game, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which was a tie-in to the other movie, the last movie. But between there, you actually worked on at least two games a as an amateur yeah. on your own. Yeah, what, yeah, I did. What, so like, I haven't been able to find anything about them other than well, the Well, yeah, I'll show, you, I'll show you one of them. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I was fascinated with computers, and suddenly I could have one in my own home. And um, the interesting thing is that Apple IIs were pretty slow. The 6502 processor ran at just about exactly one megahertz, just slightly over. And um, which meant that since the shortest instruction that uh, 6502 can process is three cycles, and most of them are four or better, that means you can do about a quarter of a million things each frame, you know, each second, really. So that's not a lot. Um, and I, I had uh, learned BASIC. Uh, years ago, when I was still in film school, actually, I, I spent a summer back in my old hometown, Hanover, New Hampshire. And that happens to be where the computer language called BASIC was invented by John Kemeny and Thomas Kurtz, who were the math uh, guys back there then. And I went back one summer. This is a long time ago. How long ago is it? It's so long ago that the instruction manual, manual that I purchased at the Dartmouth bookstore was mimeographed. It had purple ink. It was little, little flimsy pages, and I, okay. So I went up. They had a big GE time-sharing computer. I never even laid eyes on it. But in various halls around the campus, they had um, lots of teletypes set up. And so I went in there, and I, I got a code number from a friend who lived in Hanover, and typed in my little login, and I taught that machine to play scissors, rock, paper in BASIC. So I knew a little bit about that programming language. And when Apple II Pluses came out, they had a little chip in there which did BASIC. So the first thing I worked on on an Apple II uh, was in BASIC, and it was just horribly slow. I didn't really understand back then. I'm not a CS guy. I didn't really quite understand what it meant that in an interpreted language was. So um, I got a compiler. Microsoft made a compiler for Apple Basic called Task. And um, you could then, you could grind um, your basic code through this little sausage machine, and out the other end came compiled code. And it sped up everything by about a factor of 14. So I could, I did a little uh, model railroad game called Binary Gauge using this technique, low res and 
you can you can still do it today with an Apple emulator, and you can have this little trains and running around and a couple cars. Now they're just a bunch of little colored blocks, and the track is but they actually follow the track. The track is a certain color, and the the train is going along, and it's surveying to see where the track goes, and it follows the actual track just like a real train. When it runs off the edge, the system knows how to call up other files from the disk, and so you can you can piece together a gigantic, vast, very very diagrammatic railroads, and that was fun. And then I thought, okay, it's pretty slow. I think I should learn assembly language, and which I did. And uh, okay, so I'm sitting there, and I decided I wanted to make a game which was tiled. That was what you did to kind of conserve uh, space. You, you, everything was represented as tiles, and you could make larger structures by gluing the tiles together. And so I had this 20 by 10 thing, which I was going to do, and there was a little strip beneath that where I would put an interface. And I thought, well, okay, I've got this little tile. And I, I, I wrote this thing, and I had it sort of um, stored on a disk as a, tech, as a file, and then switched the Apple over into its machine language version, and you typed the magic word, the letters 3D0G. And then when you hit return, it would run whatever assembly program you would, you would put in a certain spot in memory. So Sorry. I, uh, ay, ay, ay. Yipe. Sorry. Little anyway. Keep talking. So um, I was sitting there fantasizing about the speed that was going to come up when I, when I did these tiles using assembly language. And I thought, you know, it'll probably be really fast. Instead of that horrible wave that would go through as I, as I slowly redrew the screen with the compiled basic, It'll probably be really fast. There'll be this little wave that'll go through, kind of zoo, and boy, that'll be cool. So I hit 3D OG, and there was, these, there was just this screen sitting there. And it was my tile, the, the, the one test tile, reprinted 200 times or whatever, 20 by 10. And it, it happened so fast, it, there was nothing. It was just bunk. And I realized, oh my god, if I learn to do everything in assembly language, it's going to be hundreds of times faster. So I taught myself to be an assembly language guru, and I did this entire game, Space Snatchers. And, uh, Harry uh, 6502 assembly language. Boy, oh boy. Did the guys at Lucasfilm at the time know you? you yeah, they, sort of they, they sort of did. Um, because of George, uh, in my you know, friendship with George, I, I got to know a guy who ran the, uh, that group in those days um, named Steve Arnold. He was like the second guy who ran Lucasfilm games. And I also, at that point, made friends with some people who were working there. And that's sort of how they knew me a little bit, so that later on when they wanted to do another game, they. they they knew I'd done something as a game, and they thought, well, like, let's get how. And uh, so Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis was the first game you worked on. At LucasArts, yeah. And uh, it, it, was, it was an adventure game. Mm -hmm. uh, in, yeah. in some ways, a pretty straightforward adventure game, sort of linear story, you know. Well, but, but it introduced one major innovation that I think is still pretty I, I, pretty think, it had, I think it had two, actually, but uh -oh. go ahead. Well, the one, the Three one that, for us. The one that jumped out for me was clearly the, you know, pick your play style. The, the, pa the path. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. That's what you're very fond of. Yes, I am. Yes, and I, I did it. Um, there was originally a suggestion of my collaborator, Noah Falstein, who helped me do the initial design and then f went off to do other projects, uh, leaving behind holding that three-path bag. <laughs> uh, to get those three paths in there cost about, I don't know, six months of my, t my life. In those days, that seemed like a big fraction of a game cycle. Nowadays, it's like nothing. But we've been disagreeing about this for 16 uh, years. No, no, I, I, I loved it. Oh, no, I loved doing it, but it was just really hard. It was hard to wedge it all in there. It was hard to get it to work. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 my hair started turning really gray when, during, during that period. But that's one of the innovations. I th I'm still very proud of that, and uh, the fact that we sort of brought it off. And it was, it was puzzles and well, I, I sort of introduced the idea of mini games. I, okay. kind of, they had they, in their previous uh, Jones Adventure, they they had done fighting because they knew Indy how to do that. But I introduced a whole bunch of other mini games, camel racing and sub sub docking and all sorts of other little things that you would do as activities rather than as just puzzling. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very proud of that. And I'm also proud of the fact that uh, Lucas had developed a phobia about having any of their characters get killed. And I thought, well, you know, the problem is that Indiana Jones is a an action hero, and he goes uh, in harm's way, and he, his screen persona is one of someone who's always in uh, jeopardy. And I thought if we didn't actually kill, or threaten to kill Indy, and g give you moments when it could actually happen, that we wouldn't be true to his character at all. And so we did that. And so I was a complete violation of the 
house rules when it came to that. And I'm also very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and were you involved at all in, in the action game version? There was, there was an no. adventure game. No, no, no. They, they, front, they, they, they gave that to some English guys. That seemed like a strange decision at the time. It seems even more strange looking back on it. Releasing two games with the same name with yep. different, completely yeah. different play styles. Now, Indiana Jones: The Fate of Atlantis is a big hit. It was the first, yeah, the first was. game that um, LucasArts published that was in as many as 256 colors. Woo! And um, it was also our first voice uh, production. Now there was, they had done after the fact a, um, a voicing of Loom. Oh. But it was done with very clunky technology. It wasn't done in a m proper way. It was barely there. It was like it was literally like movies when you had somebody needle dropping a record to do the sound. It was literally like that. Uh, whereas our, ours was a real production. It was all digital and everything. So speaking of Loom, did did you have a sense when you were there at, at Lucasfilm that that it was it was sort of a golden age? I mean, looking yeah, back at you and Noah, yeah, I did and actually. Dave Grossman and, and Ron yeah. Gilbert and Tim Schafer and, and Brian Moriarty. Brian did, Moriarty did, I did mean, Loom, yeah. I, I thought it was great. It was wonderful. Um, but that was then. This is now. So, <laughs> not much on reminiscing, are you? you know. Well, I had a wonderful time. Brian was a very good friend of mine, and, and um, uh, we had a wonderful time there. It was uh, the one thing that was really good was that we all believed in adventure games in those days, and um, we all did our best to advance the state of the art with everything we did. And there were huge discussions and design seminars that were going on informally, constantly, to kind of uh, make that happen. Um, I don't see that going on anymore, really, quite the way it did then. And where did, where did SCUM come into that? that was the, SCUM. Was, the SCUM was the underlying engine that had been developed about three or four projects earlier, and it kept evolving a little bit. But right. um, So uh, actually, one thing, uh, I, I don't know that, that we've actually defined adventure game. I mean, do you? What do you mean when you say? Well, I th when I think of an adventure game, I, I think of a story that, that it, it's 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 driven by a story, and the task of the player is to open up that story and allow it to proceed by solving puzzles. And uh, you you've worked on on several of them. It seems like at some point, the form just sort of I don't know if it stopped evolving, but it. People well, tend not to make them anymore. The truth is, that's happened? the only adventure game I ever did. Actually, wait, I guess that's kind of true, isn't it? I, um, in my own personal taste is, is action adventure and, and RPGs. Where did you get this reputation then? Uh, I don't know. Well, well, it's a good one. It, no, no, I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> it's not, it's just you, you, you're kind of thought of as an adventure game guy, and I'm I not know. actually sure why now. I know, and, and maybe that'll happen again because I've wor been working on one recently, but. Um, uh, the truth is, that's the only one that I ever did here. Um, most of the other stuff I've done is what I think of as action adventure, or sometimes called character action. It's um, where you have story elements that are pretty strong, but you also have a world that's pretty coherent, and you can you can be at play in that world, and you can shoot the shit out of a lot of bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and, and was that what you did in Big Sky Trooper? I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious about how Big you Sky Trooper is a, sort of a li lightweight RPG, yeah. So and you shoot a lot of things called slugs, these little green jelly-like creatures, and they, they come in varieties. They, 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 um, they're graded. They, they're like little one-eyed guys, and when you shoot them, they pop, and that's it for them. If, they're, if they have two eyes, you shoot them, and they, they, they bud and divide into two one-eyed guys, and you still got to get the one-eyed guys. And the really bad ones are like five eyes, and you shoot them, and there's like a three and a two out of the deal. It's like the atomic fission. That's, that's great design. I mean, we've talked about that a couple of times now with uh, great player feedback. I mean, you, you kind well, of know what's going to happen when you, when you attack. Exactly. Guys. But on top yeah. of that, I also had, had intuitively knew even then what has now become one of our rules of thumb, which is that you can't, uh, this is kind of due to Dan Airy, you can't just vary your, your, your monsters and your evil bad guys by degree. You have to have different kinds as well. So, of course, we had bosses to go along with that. You know, I'm going to completely break out of chronology here for just a second. That's one of our rules. That that obviously brings to mind the 400 project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hal and Noah Noah Falstein have been working for a while now, since 2000, yeah. 2001. 2001. On on creating what is in essence a language, uh, or a lexicon at least, of game design. That's the hope. We're not especially energetic at pursuing it, and don't have a lot of other people uh, that have jumped on the bandwagon. So um, 
Uh, it's, it's languishing a little bit, but well, we've got more than 100 of these things codified now. So uh, what, what was the genesis of that, that project? I mean, we're, we're well, jumping way ahead here now. Yeah, and this started in 2001. I'd, I'd given a number of talks at the Game Developers Conference out west, and uh, I was on the advisory board of that organization for 10 years. So I sort of had an inside track, and I, I have an interest in sort of a peculiar subject matter, I guess. And I thought it would be very interesting to talk about um, how we go about summarizing what we know in a way that's productive so we can actually do stuff and we actually build games. And we're not critics, we're trying to make them. And, and how do we do it? Well, the human brain is an extremely powerful instrument and we can use it to reason our way to the solution of a lot of the problems that we face. But the problems that we face are so enormous in number and difficulty that we really aren't that good at being able to actually reason everything out. And instead, we secretly rely on a lot of rules of thumb. Some of those rules are actually explicitly known to us, and some of them are only tacitly known. And I believe that they, these rules are the substance of um, productive knowledge and game design. And conceal in their surface uh, stupidity um, deep wisdom. And that, uh, and in this respect, we are very similar to almost all the other arts, and including engineering, for example, and so on, where you always have tons of rules of thumb. You know, how, how, what's, the over, what's the overload a bridge must be built to withstand? You know, is, is it 100% is it, uh, uh, over or 50% over? There's some rule that people have decided is good engineering practice. It's not theory. It's just... Um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, bridges fell down, and then if you did the overload right, they didn't. And okay, that's the rule. I learned recently, I, I, I love to collect these things. Um, for example, in improv theater, how do those guys do it? You know, it just seems like magic. And yet you realize they do it night after night, so they must have some techniques. Well, one of the fundamental techniques is accept all suggestions. So that, for example, if, uh, if I propose to you and you're my fellow improv guy, I say, let's get out of the corner and beat up that uh, homeless guy. And you say, oh, God, no, that would be terrible. Well, there goes the act. We can't go any further. But if you say, you know, that sounds like a good idea. God, that's weird. OK, now we can go somewhere. And um, the most recent rule that I, I discovered is in the, wor in the world of stopping asteroids from colliding with Earth. If you want to stop an asteroid from colliding with Earth, the rule of thumb is you have to change its velocity by one millimeter a second 10 years before it's going to hit the Earth to, in order to be able to move it aside one Earth radius. That's the rule of thumb. Okay, so to make a game, I have to move my lead program <laughs> one degree away from what he actually wants to do. Uh, the, these rules don't have too ten much. Ten years before the game shifts? Uh. Uh, okay. I guess the, if, if there's a rule of thumb in our group that, that it's not really in there, actually, but the, 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 if a rule is in there that it has anything to do with programming, it would be never believe a programmer who tells you it will take two weeks to do whatever it is he's <laughs> telling you it will do. <laughs> God, that is so true. Uh. <laughs> Two weeks is the standard answer for, to every question when you talk to programmers. Sorry, programmers, you know it. You know I'm right. <laughs> how, how long will it take to get that Denver uh, baggage thing going? Oh, two weeks. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, what, what were some of the inspirations for this? I mean, uh, I've well, heard you I, talk about linguistics and yeah, I'm, I'm very. I, I'm, I read a lot of science books and, and um, have, a, have an interest in all this stuff. And, and I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that we can uh, deploy our minds to attack these problems with, with a great deal of um, you know, uh, deep focus in, in, in how to get these things solved. And yet I realize that running around in my own head, when I get myself in trouble in a design problem, I find myself reaching back to some, something that I, I either know worked or I saw worked somewhere else, and then I will then do a trope on that or whatever, you know. And you realize, oh, you know, we, we don't necessarily just think everything out from ground zero to completion every time. And uh, no one else does either. The architects don't do it. The um, journalists don't do it. I mean, yes, journalists have to learn a lot of deep things about their, um, their craft. But a journalist, the very first thing he learns is put who, what, why, when, where in the lead paragraph. And that's a rule of thumb. So. And in the, in the first talk you, you gave about this, you, you, it was uh, four of the 400. Right? right. I also believe that what's going on is that when we design games, uh, um, four of the 400 was the, was the talk that set this off and, and got me interested. I was, I was also reacting to someone um, that you know, Doug Church, 
uh, with his formal abstract nice. design tools, which I don't believe in at all. I think they're worthless. Excellent. So. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, nobody should ever, you, you're just you're unusable, they'll never be usable. And I was reacting against that. But I also, I was also thinking that the world is discovery. So for example, in the, in the world of film, uh, it was, there was a discovery that cuts would work. There were, it, it's hard to realize this now, but back in 1895 or in 1900 or so, there was a, a solid body of theorists who believed that the only proper movie is you turn the camera on, the actors go and do what they do, the film runs out, that's your movie. And other people thought, you know, uh, if you do the bust of a, of a human being, nobody is too disturbed that you didn't do the whole body. And for that matter, if you um, go to a stage play, there'll be a curtain that comes down in the middle and then it'll go back up again and that doesn't disturb anybody. And people decided that you could just clip pieces of film together, little snippets, and they would look staccato on screen, but the mind would assemble that into a coherent whole. That was a discovery. What was the discovery? Well, the discovery was the discovery of how to manipulate material, which is film, take the, photo take, the, take the shots and then glue them together. And the other discovery was human psychology, that humans can accept that idea and, and use it. And, it's, and not only that, but enjoy it and, and, and make sense of it easily, intuitively. Another thing that was bothersome to people, people didn't understand the close-up. And, and in fact, I believe this is learned because I can remember when I was a tiny little kid when I did first go to movies that I thought people had become gigantic when the cuts happened. And that's that, but quickly you learn a, a literacy, like, like, like reading and writing. You learn a literacy of film and you find out that when the camera goes closer, no, their, their shape doesn't change. The camera got closer, so they're just they're just closer to you, and um, these are and then you know so there's this this material that you have, and then what it does, and then how you react psychologically, and that's what rules do in the world of game design. There there you know, there are certain materials you have, uh, you're, you know, you're constrained by time and budget. You have certain um, uh, ideas, mechanics that you want to you know that you think will attract people to, to play that people find satisfying, and then the third part of that is what people want to do and what they don't want to do. People will love to do um, a tracking game. I'll show you a tracking game later, that, you know, like Guitar Hero, where, where you know, all it is is things coming down a track and you're trying to figure out the little buttons on your guitar to nail the little things as they go past the bridge. And um, that's the mechanic of that game. And it turns out, I'll be damned, people like that. So um, that's, that's where the rules come from, this, this concept that there's this kind of intellectual force and then there's the material and then there's human beings with you know what they will appreciate what they what they latch on to what they're interested in well, one of the things I, I really like about the 400 project um, which I believe there's th is the column is still going on in yeah game Noah still does it, so yeah. there's there's still a column every if you're not if you don't get game developer magazine it's well worth reading um, the, the thing I really like about them uh, without getting into the formal abstract design tools or game design patterns or any of that other stuff right now well, time is we'll, okay um, they're very concrete and, yeah. and as, as a designer, when I read them, I go, oh, I see how that applies to this problem I'm having right now, not, not a more sort of vague conceptual thing. So c can we talk about some of the rules? And, and yeah, we can. Let me first say a little reaction to that, uh, sure. which, which is that you know, if, if you want to be in this business, or if you want to be a writer, for that matter, um, what you want to develop isn't necessarily a critical understanding of what you're doing. I mean, you should read your Raja. Roger Kaiwa and uh, you know and all that stuff and and get your game theory down, but um, it, you know what you really want is a productive understanding. You want to understand your métier well enough so that you know what to do when given the essentially blank page. When you just what do I do when I start? And um, critics, you know, are always interested in you know. Um, you know, let's for example in architecture, the, the, the soaring spirit of this new uh, building or whatever they're putting up today in Hong Kong or Shanghai. But to an architect, they never think like that. That's not what they're interested in. Uh, there's a, there's a, f a wonderful um, uh, quote about this. Um, the famous um, music conductor, Toscanini, was asked about um, uh, uh, the Third Symphony of Beethoven. And he said, well, some think it's about Napoleon, and some think it's, a, think it's about the human spirit, and I think it's allegro non troppo. You know, in other words, for me, it's just 
conduct the music. It's, it is this concrete thing. And you, you just have to realize that if you're going to be a creative person, you're always going to be, your ideas always must collide with solid material. So, some rules. Fight player fatigue. Yeah, people get tired. Games are work. You're working hard. If you're, if you're an RPG, you're working especially hard. And um, so there must be charms to, to keep you involved. If there aren't charms, you'll abandon the game. Now, it turns out that, I don't know, out there in that world, the, the last game you played, how many of you finished it? I'll be damned. You that's that's, a, high, that's a higher percentage than most people, I would say. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, if I asked you the last movie you went to, how many sat through to the end? Yeah. The last book you read, how many finished it? Ah, terrible, because that's, you've been reading those textbooks again. <laughs> All right. So, um, and, and in, in the, the, the longer descriptions of these rules, I mean, there, there are specific examples cited of the kinds of charms that can, that can keep you playing. Right. So again, very practical stuff. Um, maximize expressive potential. These are, I mean, these are ones that speak to me. I mean, every one well, of these speaks to me. And yet I think we disagree fundamentally on a lot of stuff. You know? Very likely. Yeah. Um, Use your own rules. <laughs> uh, well, no, but I like these rules. Well, this, this, rule, this, this rule is a favorite of mine because I think that um, there's a, there, there's, there's, here's a, writing, a drama, dramatic writing rule. And it's a rule of thumb. And what it is is that you take all the characters in your story, and even if this isn't going to wind up in your play or screenplay, or maybe in your book, write a scene between every pair of characters. Well, what's that for? because you're looking for the maximum use of all your material. You've got to cast the characters. They're only going to be able to do so much. You don't want to miss the best things that they could be doing with each other. So you, you try it out. You see how they behave with each other. And that's what's going on. I mean, you need to look at all the things you could do. When, if you've got a mechanic that is like, uh, let's say, a platform. Let's say it's like Rayman. You know, you're doing a platformer. Uh, the, you know, this is the, 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 great, the greatest platformer ever. The, the, um, the second one, the first 3D one, and okay, how does Ansel get the most platforming out of that guy? You know, all the little, all the little bouncing rock things, all the little surfboard things that he does that, 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 that make that thing work. That's his way of ex taking all the juice and getting it out of the orange, which is the idea. Um, and if you don't, I'm sorry, and just to be, to go one thing further, it, it was worthwhile keeping these things in mind consciously because otherwise you don't, pay attention you don't do that and it's not necessarily intuitive you sometimes have to really stretch to be able to kind of find the stuff maintain level of abstraction ah yes yes um, if you're doing a little game like Big Sky Trooper which is a, a SNES game and um, you're dealing with a controller and you're dealing with uh, a game that was purchased by mom played by a child and um, if the thing doesn't work, mom will take it right back to the store and get her money back, as opposed to a computer game. And so the result is, not only that, but there aren't too many dots on the screen and you're, everything's kind of cute and cartoony. When you've got that sort of aesthetic, you can now have a very simplistic sort of dialogue system. Do you understand? Yes, no, click, and on to the next thing. If you're doing a game such as the one that I'm currently working on right now, which is an adventure game, um, it's, a, it's a gritty, melodramatic uh, spy game um, about the famous uh, dancer and courtesan, Mata Hari, about uh, in the 10-year period before World War I. And it's all, it's all done with sort of very realistic looking backgrounds and so forth. You just can't get away with that kind of dialogue. That, that, kind, that, 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 that sort of um, abstract formality just doesn't work when you see you know, perfectly formed human beings walking back and forth. So uh, on the one hand, you don't want a really naturalistic dialogue system to go with these little cartoony things. On the other hand, you don't want this little cartoon dialogue system to go with realistic characters. So you have to, you have to find a, a constant level. Uh, an allied rule of thumb in uh, writing a book, for example, is try to, you have to make a decision about how far in you will go to mental life. So for example, if you read the Count of Monte Cristo, Duma, there is no mental life. It's all just a series. It's like a 500-page screenplay of one vivid scene after another of uh, the adventures in that book. On the other hand, if you're a Nicholson Baker and you write the mezzanine, 
the entire book takes place where the guy's coming back from lunch where he went and bought a little trinket and he goes into the office building where he works and he gets on the escalator that takes him up to the mezzanine and 175 pages later he gets to the top. And the whole book is his mental life going up the escalator. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, th th that's kind of what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, Does that make sense? Totally, totally. Um, yeah, we, we it, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we call that unity of effect. You know, yeah. You have a much more. Okay, much I like more, that. I like that. Unity of effect, yes. No, but yours yours makes sense and ours we have no, to explain. No, no, I, li I like that. Um, so, uh, now, that, now that the 400 Project is it's it's what seven years old, I guess. I guess. Um, so okay, what what's been the response? I mean, I, I, the first uh, first week of this class, I I, I my impression. These guys well, that we don't have a language of design. I know. How's um, yours going? Well, uh, it, it's it's languishing. It's it's um, it proceeds by fits and starts. Noah tends the embers in the pages of Game Developer Magazine. We have got a spreadsheet up on our websites that you can download. Um, and it, it has some of the uh, l rules with their little 25 words or less description of what they mean and how you use them and um, uh, the attribution, of course, who thought them up and brought them to our attention and um, what they trump. Because one of the things you learn about rules is they contradict each other and they even con sometimes contradict themselves. And so you have to understand domain. This rule applies in this domain but not others. Or you have to also understand if you have two rules, you know, which one wins, you know, because they, um, Rules are not terribly consistent, and rules are, are by nature, um, as you know, um, in Pirates of the Caribbean, where, where Kira Knightley gets kidnapped, and you know she says, "Well, the pirates' rules." She says, "Well, the royal rules are really more or less guidelines, you know, than anything else." Well, that's kind of the way it is, and um, a, a dumb a rules are by nature kind of um, just stated, and they're 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 they're, they're, they're very practical. So, for example, here's a rule of gravity: what goes up must come down. But we know that's not totally true, or we wouldn't be sending, um, you know, Dawn out to the asteroids these days. And uh, on, on the other hand, no one's yet um, uh, falsified Einstein's version and the actual physics rule, you know, the physics law. So rules aren't laws. Do do, do you ever do, do rules ever go away? Have you found some that are more useful than others? Some that are not useful? Uh, you know, or not I valid? yeah, I, I find I, I I have my own little set, and um, I, I don't necessarily they're not all in that that list. Um, I, I'd be, the list would be overpopulated with my rules <laughs> if I stuck them all in there. Um, but I, I do think that I only, I think everybody only uses a few. I think there's a, there's a lot of them that haven't been discovered. My whole idea of the four or the 400 was I can think of these four rules to start things off. What else is out there? What else do people know about? What, when you go to work in the morning, what are you thinking about? And if you have to make a difficult decision and you're on the fence, you know, and you have to duck and cover, what are you going to do? Which way are you going to go? How are you going to jump? And what is it that governs your choice when you make that decision? Um, and so we're trying to get people to discover rules because it's kind of an undiscovered country. Okay, well, I'm totally seeing a, a new assignment for the class here. Pretty soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Here's oh, a good one. Oh, Here's oh, a good rule. Oh. It's, it's, uh, it was just discussed recently in an article in Game Developer Magazine. It's been in our rule base for quite a while. Um, allow the player to turn the game off. <laughs> but what that means is um, that you should have a save game system which is so sophisticated that it'll have no, it has no effect when the player turns the game off. Uh, I believe that is a valid rule. This, I believe, is the third week of three that the concept of save games has come up. I guess that's an important uh, thing for game right. de design. Um, okay, so uh, actually we're, we're a little more than halfway through. Uh, why don't we take a, a break? We'll come back, continue talking about games. Uh, and uh, maybe get to some Q&A. And All maybe right. even a little presentation. Yeah, OK. Sounds great. OK. We're going to do a little bit more uh, talking together. And then Hal's going to do some talking on his own. And uh, then, I don't know, we'll see what happens after that. We'll see how much time there is. Um, there were a couple more games that you worked on uh, in particular. We're not going to go through the whole, the whole you know, list here. but. Um, you you did a, a game called Indiana Jones and His Desktop Adventures, which I found utterly charming and appealing when it came out uh, in the mid-90s, and followed up with the Yoda stories. Uh, can, why don't you describe those and tell people yeah, what they those were? Yeah, are, those are a little... It's before the era of casual games. PopCap didn't exist. And uh, I wanted uh, LucasArts to get interested in, in um, finding a broader audience 
for what we do. And instead of just having it be, you know, 99% guys, which was the case um, in the middle 90s. I think uh, Fate of Atlantis had the largest uh, female um, uh, player base of any game we ever made at, at Lucas, and it was like 5% or 6% or something like that of returned cards. And probably some of those bought it for their kids and their boyfriends, you know. So I'm not sure that uh, we, we managed to penetrate very much there. And I was way ahead of my time with these ideas. Eventually the casual market came in and uh, everybody these days from EA on down want to try to figure out ways to broaden the audience, looking at the examples of the big success that casual games are having and also uh, Xbox Live and also the Wii, which is appealing to a broad audience. But in those days, it wasn't the case. I'm, al I'm always interested in storytelling, but I've, I've always been interested in the idea that you could create a story which would just keep telling itself again and again and with some novelty. Now, I wasn't crazy enough to think that I could come up with a game where on, in one go, you are over here and now we're in a submarine um, and we're, we're you know, on the seabed and, and another version we're you know, on the planet Jupiter uh, doing something there. That, that's impossible, but I thought it could be a little bit like chess, where you have six pieces and 64 squares, and the intricacies of how the pieces move dictate that after a few moves, you have a unique situation. The, the way that everything can combine allows things to be never the same again, or almost never the same, at least in detail. So I thought there was a way to do this by having puzzles, which um, could be algorithmically hooked up you know, whatever it is that I need to get, and whatever tool I'm going to use to get something, and then what I get and then becomes a, a thing I can use to get something else. And we divided this into various categories. We had transactions where you deal with a human being, and we had tools which you know, operated on things, and we had valuables which just really didn't have any um, particular use. Uh, and we had keys. And we had a, a random world generator, and we built like five or six hundred of these little what we called zones. Each one was little, four little screens wide. You could run around it, and then you go off the edge, and another one would slide in. And, um, and then um, you're busy um, down in Mexico um, trying to save uh, artifacts from the looters uh, in the 20s before Jones became a really famous guy. That was the, the first one. And it was fun, and, and I've, it took me two years to get the company to agree to do it because it, it seemed very... Um, silly to them. And they were sort of right. Jones only sold 35,000 units or so oh. in its first um, go around. And, uh, One not to me. They, they were, hey. And, uh, and it got very, very bad critical reaction. So I, my name was Mud for a little while. Um, but they were willing to let me follow it up with Yoda stories, which is a big improvement over the of the structure of Jones. One of the things I, l I learned in Jones was that there was just one puzzle skein. So whatever the input to one puzzle and uh, produced an output which was the input to the next one and you could just put the beads on the string and get to the end. And pretty soon it, it, me it meant that the player would be, was able to anticipate that whenever he found something that wasn't just you know, some kind of healing root or some kind of food or whatever it was that would help sustain Jones and you know, prevent him from dying from the attacks of all the little scorpions and adders that were running around. Um, there was going to be a significant part of the puzzle chain, and it reduced some of the mystery and, and, and some of the sense of spaciousness of the game. So for Yoda stories, we, we thought hard about how we could make that better so that it would be harder to understand when I picked up something exactly what it would be good for and start to raise speculation in the player, raise anticipation in the mind of the player rather than just, oh man, I just got to this next thing. I've just gotten to the next station. And we didn't have any money and we didn't have any time, so what I did was go click and I took the puzzle chain and I just broke it in half. So you're pursuing two puzzles, um, simul two puzzle chains simultaneously. You're not quite sure which one, which items go with which one. And all we did is at the very end when you get to the boss levels, we did a double gate. So you need two different things to get through to deal with the final boss. That seemed to work much better. Uh, Yoda stories also sold really well. We just sold a, just a gazoo, tons and tons of those things. So that was good. And um, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that, that there's kind of a story. There's 15 scenarios. And Yoda also, there were 15 in the Jones game, but they were all completely disconnected. And the only thing that held them together was the, the, you know, operating out of a little uh, village in Mexico. But in, in Yoda, um, we uh, 
we have three different terrains. You can go to in the snowy areas, and the, 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 some stories take place in desert areas. Some take place in jungles, and um, you can. It kind of keeps stats so that if you go through, uh, you get you get scored for that. And if if you play enough of them, you get a better lightsaber and you know stuff like that. Some power ups. So dur during the break, you were talking about. Um, the, the, the graphics were very simple and easy Yeah, the, my, if I look back, and, and I still play the game, I actually still play it because it, it contains just enough novelty each time I play so that I don't totally anticipate everything. And so it has genuine replayability in, in a story game format, which is hard to do. It's one thing to have Bejeweled be replayable and you know Mummy Maze be replayable, but to actually have a story game, it's, it's very hard to get that to happen. And so I'm, I'm very proud of this game. But I'm not very knocked out by the graphics, which seem incredibly dated. And uh, we went for the big head style, and, and uh, um, we also made the screen very small. And now if I were doing it again, I'd, I'd, instead of like, I don't know how big the little 10 by 10 grid is, but it should be much bigger on your screen, and it should be like isometric tiles instead of just top-down tiles, and so on and so forth. And I think those very simple aesthetic improvements would have um, given the game quite a different reception and so keep it around even more now. Th that, that algorithmic approach to storytelling and, and encouraging replayability by taking small elements and having them add up to, to yeah. unique experiences, that's, that is kind of the heart of what I think is important in games, and I try to do that in my, in my games all the time. Yay. But the, 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 the thing for me is, the, the higher the fidelity of the graphics, the more difficult that becomes because you have to display the outcomes of all those algorithmic Unity of effect. Systems. Exactly. Yeah. So to some extent, I think if, if you went much further in improving the graphics on Yoda Stories or Indiana yeah. Desktop Adventures, I don't think it would work. What happens, is you're, you're, on, you're on to something, of course. Um, in a very naturalistic world, some of the artificialities that can't be scoured out of this sort of algorithmic approach start to look, um, stand out more like, more like sore thumbs than, than when the graphics are more diagrammatic and everything seems abstract. Yep. It's a perfect example of that rule. It's w one of the reasons I'm excited to be working with Disney because they're not quite so fanatical about super hyper-realistic stuff, which gives us the opportunity to do uh, yeah. more uh, interesting and player-driven uh, kind of games. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Um, so uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to touch on Two other two other games that you worked on, or two other game types, I guess, uh, and then I'm going to get off the stage for a little while and let you do your thing. All right, uh, do your magic. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, in whatever order you, you think is appropriate, uh, we really need to talk about Matahari, the project you're working on now. Let's do that last. Okay, and uh, the 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 casual games. I mean, one of the things you, that I think you're going to talk about yeah. after I get out of here and let you do your thing. Well, I'm very, is uh, I'm very in smaller casual games. Yeah, I'm interested in little games. Um, I, I, uh, the, the last game I did at, at, at Lucas, um, I was on that project for 39 months, three years and, and uh, three months. I was creative on that project for about six months, and then I was a management droid for three years. Um, that's tough. I don't like to do that. I, I, I'm impatient. Um, patience is, is, is a virtue, but it's not a very big virtue, otherwise I'd be dead. <laughs> but, um, anyway, um, so little games, I like quick projects, and, and, and the little games allow me to do some of that. And, um, I'm very interested in the, in, the, in the casual game phenomenon. I, I like, I, I myself am drawn to games, but I am not a fanatical uh, person. I'll never play Halo, um, or Half-Life for that matter. Uh, the, the games like that, that uh, just don't attract me. Um, I'm not going to obsess over my 55th level um, whatever the hell in Worlds of Warcraft either. So that's kind of what's going on there. And, and it, it, you know, again, I've, I, we were talking in the break. I've, I've tried to actually to work on smaller games, and somehow, you know, every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. And I, I think it's a I little end bit up doing like a big game. Oddly enough, there's an analog. Uh, it's not the same, and the economics are different. But there is a there's an echo here from the TV and the movie business, which is especially the movie business, where um, most studios would rather gamble big bucks on on something they think will be a big hit than than modest amounts of dollars on something they're reasonably sure will be successful, but only modestly successful. And uh, so that the, every now and then you get a Paul Haggis doing Crash, but it doesn't happen very often. And, yeah, I run into that wall all the time. Yeah. Um, so let's turn to Matahari. 
Okay. Uh, and, and talk about that. Well, three interesting adventure... things there that I don't quite understand. So you're going to have to run through them for me. Tell me what they are. Uh, a new approach to dialogue. I'm always interested in that because we are still stuck in 1992, yeah. okay. near as I can tell. And if you got the next big thing, I want you to spill your beans. We have here. a thing. I don't know if it's big. Well, let's, well <laughs> if I can steal it, I'm stealing it. And, Please. Uh, it's not patented, copyright, or anything. The concept of tokens. Yep. You mentioned that in an interview, yeah. and I don't get that. Well, you will. And uh, it, what was the last one? Oh my gosh! Um, oh, the, the, you're tracking multiple oh, scores. Oh, scores. So that's well, an interesting thing to me. Vetcher games are alive and well in Germany. They never quite went away. It turns out, actually, even back in the old days, Germany was one of our biggest audiences. Um, Fate of Atlantis was a big hit everywhere uh, 15 years ago, but it was its the biggest hit in Germany. And I'm still sort of famous there. That's very odd. You guys ever been to E3? You know the concept of booth babe, yes? Where there's more silicon in the women than there is in the machines, right? <laughs> okay. So, and what you see when you go to E3 are all these guys with, their, with 15 yards of cloth in their pants, you know, with some kind of horrible lime green and baby blue shirt with yellow piping and, you know, terrible hair and glasses on like this. And they're standing with some unbelievably alluring woman while their equally geeky friend takes a picture, right? <laughs> well, I was over in Germany not long ago doing PR for Mata Hari, and um, so we went to this booth. It's the, the German publishing um, uh, brand, not the company, is, is called Anaconda, and so they had a big booth at their equivalent of E3, which is called GCDC in Leipzig. And uh, 200,000, unlike E3, it's for the public. It's going to be, it's like E3, E for all will be. And 200,000 people come to this show. It's just, a, it's just an amazing cacophony of noise. And there are booth babes, of course, everywhere. And um, how cool am I? I'm so cool that at the Anaconda booth, the booth babes wanted to have their picture taken with me. <laughs> <laughs> so the Venture Games are hot over there. And Is that uh, one of the scores you're tracking? No. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, it's... Um, it's a classic adventure game, but the problem is that uh, Germany is a perfectly first world country, and the money that they make over there is at least what we make, and uh, probably in, in denominated in numbers. And of course, euros are worth a dollar forty now. So, wow, they, they, they do okay, and um, and yet they actually tackle projects that you would spend five times as much on here in, in the United States, and they do these adventure games for amazingly low amounts of money. How do they do it? Well. At Lucas, when I was there, we had a company of about 400 people, about 200 were actually active developers. And of that 200, at least 100 were hardly able to do their jobs. And when you go to a studio, a small studio, like for example, Rob Hubner's little studio up in Marin now, Nihilistic, or if you go to Germany where they have little studios, um, and there are very few people there, 100% of the people there know what they're supposed to be doing because the, 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 everything would collapse if that weren't true. So it's a, it's a big deal. And um, so they, they actually tackle these projects that you wouldn't dream of tackling here. And nevertheless, they're heavily budget constrained. So let's get to the scoring thing first. There is just not enough material that we can put in a game and get it done that um, by itself would, 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 would constitute a totally full-fledged puzzle game. So we decided to introduce very vaguely, some RPG-ish sort of ideas. Just to kind of, for the completest player, the player who just wants to obsess over every little possible detail. And we introduced three, three factors. Um, if you solve the puzzles um, first time through, pretty much, and you have very few um, backtracking uh, episodes that you have to do, we, 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 we um, track that, and you have a skill score. If you, um, in, 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 there are Easter eggs in amongst all your, all your real spy missions, the things that occupy most of your time and attention. You'll be in somebody's bedroom, and um, over in the corner, there's something you can pick up, and it's a clue to an, sort of an off screen set of uh, missions that you only partly do. So each mission is about you find three things, and a newspaper headline spins up, and you've had some effect on the development of submarines or um, metal alloys, alloys in airplanes or the latest radio direction finding equipment or whatever is going on. And uh, so there's, there's a, there's a spy, that's called spycraft. Mm -hmm. And then um, she was a famous dancer. She's sort of um, elevated uh, striptease to a high art and attracted uh, wealthy um, benefactors and high society got interested in her for a while. 
Um, so y there's a dance game. And you, uh, you have to dance to solve puzzles to attract uh, people you need to meet in order to further your spy career. But in addition to that, you can um, go th through the world and you can find what are inspirations. And um, if you have a new inspiration, you can go back to your manager and say, look, I've got this inspiration. And you show a little move. And then you can go and you can dance voluntarily. And you make money. So we also track wealth. Are you worried about introducing a skill game into an adventure game? No. Should I be? <laughs> it seems like. I've done it before, <laughs> so okay. I'm doing it again. You're, you're, you're the, well, you've only done one. You're not the expert anymore. No, I'm not. Um, but, I, but, it was, but I got away with it. Okay. So we're doing, we're doing a dance game. We're doing um, decoder games. I will show you a little bit of a wiretapping uh, prototype Excellent. and so forth. Anyway. Okay. So that's score. Yeah. OK. What are tokens? Tokens are, have to do with the dialogue system. Um, I've always been very unhappy with the way dialogue works in any game. Uh, it doesn't have to be an, an adventure game. If you look at the latest version of Destroy All Humans, in the second game, they introduced uh, dialogue. And you have dialogue stuff. Well, it looks just like an adventure game. You walk up to some person you're supposed to talk to, and there's like four choices. And you sort of think, hmm, shall I say this or shall I say that? And you've looked at everything, and then you click on one, and he says the very thing you've just been reading. So you've got this double whammy of boredom. And I don't like that very well. And yet, I've never found a system which seemed to really work. Now, the, the guys at Telltale, David Grossman and those guys, they're using a slight variation, which I like, where um, Sam and Max will have um, their kind of concepts that they're going to talk about. It's, it's not simply one word. It's not simply an emotional state of, are you happy, are you angry? Or, you know, it's not like that. It's kind of a summary of, um, you know, expresses his displeasure. And you click on that, and then Sam will say something witty. So it, it, it grows out of it without, without being valued ethically or aesthetically you know, in, 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 in terms of what you're doing. You know, do something evil, do something good, you know, it, it, or say something, say something shocking, you know, nothing like that. It's just a little dis sort of a description of what you might say. But when you click, you get a more full-flowered version. And that's not bad. And we've had conversations about that sort of thing. But what I really like is something that I introduced. I got the idea originally from Brian Moriarty, who was wanted to use it in uh, a game that was going to be made called The Dig at, at, uh, at LucasArts. Mm -hmm. He never finished that game, and it sort of lay there. I, I used a similar system in Big Sky Trooper, where you, need to, you have a spirit guide named Fido, this little funny dog guy. It was up on a big display screen in your ship. And you can propose topics to talk to him by playing tokens. And what it is is the idea is that if you are in an adventure game, or for that matter, it can be an RPG or whatever, where you have a, to get through a locked door, you must find the key. So let's take the very simplest kind of puzzle. You find the key, now you have an item. And in general, the way um, modern interfaces work, it's all point and click. So you pick up the item, and it becomes your cursor. And you go over, and you drop it on the locked door, and ka-chunk, now you're in. And that's a solid item. But then when you go talk to somebody, bing, up come all the dialogue choices. Well, we just, and, and, and for that matter, uh, information must be handled in a special way in a, in a game because you want the player to have to go through um, all the uh, rigors of the game no matter what uh, they may know in a meta sense. So for example, if you've ever played Myst, um, there's a, um, a puzzle where you have to um, set a bunch of knobs and come out with a total of 57 volts. And there's an elaborate clue where you go to this observatory and you fool around in there. It's like you're solving a puzzle. And all you get is the, um, uh, uh, the, t the number, 57 volts, or, or the setting of the, wh the wheels, the little handles are set for you if, you if you actually decode that. But if I tell you you need to go 2, 2, 1, or whatever to make the tree go up and down, you don't have to go and get the clue anymore. You can run right into the tree trunk, set your little steam controls, and bang, the tree goes up. So they were a little mistaken, the, those cyan guys. And what they thought was a puzzle actually was just a clue. Well, what that means is that in adventure games, you must, you must concretize information. So you can't tell people ideas. You have to give them a telegram or have a, a book or some, a note that was written or whatever. Um, the deed of gift, what, whatever it is. And um, we decided that that shouldn't be true, that you should be able to, ha be able to do two things, that we, we're going to unify all materials in the game. So if it's an idea, it's still an item. And, uh, and you must get that item. It doesn't, it doesn't have any, uh, it, it's cognitive dissonance land. It's just, what is it really? Well, all it is is a concept. But it has a solid form visually on screen as a token. 
and as when it's sitting in your inventory. So it has the same status in your inventory as all your little keys and tools and whatever they are. are. And you can use them. The other second part of tokens is you use them in the same way that you use items. So the way in which you talk to people is you take, um, uh, if you need to start a, you have a little starter conversation, you drop it on the guy and okay, you, there's, a, there's a preliminary uh, exchange of pleasantries, let's say. And then um, you'll find that some of the things in your inventory are grayed out. You can't talk to this person about them. And then some of the things are, are subject matter. And you just play them on them like you're playing a lock on a key, I mean a key on a lock and conversation ensues. Now, what this requires, it, it, first of the good part is, we unify everything. We don't worry about whether um, you have materials or not. You can treat ideas just like solid objects so that, for example, you might find a sketch in a book. You might learn that there's somebody's written 24 to 1, and you got a token for that. Oh, 24 to 1. And now you can go use that on a combination lock as if you, you know, had your memory. You just use that token and ting. So you literally have turned it into a key. And likewise, you can take items and talk to people about them. And uh, so, you don't, so just, it's not just abstract ideas you get to talk about this way. And the, the benefit is that the conversation that does two things. The conversation is surprising. So you're, you're, you're as interested in what your main character is going to say as the other characters are. And you know her, and you know sort of how she's going to react. And she'll never betray you. This is a, a, an important point you have to actually take care of. But um, you don't really quite know how she's going to handle a situation. You just know you can try this out, and let's see what she does, what she comes up with. So you have a lot of fun with um, this third-person character. This would never work in a first-person game. But with Matahari, it's great. Um, and the, 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 the thing you have to be careful of, which is not guaranteed to be successful, is that if I think I'm going to talk to somebody and I sort of have a suspicion that I need to butter that person up, if I suddenly start swearing at them out of nowhere and alienate that person, and I didn't know it was going to happen, now I don't trust the game. It's not that I don't trust Matahari, I don't trust the game. I'm a player and I think, oh my god, I'm paranoid, I, I can't do anything right. This is a sure way to knock people out of a game by betraying their trust. So instead, you must, as a designer and writer, be very certain that everything you get Matahari to do or any of the other people that, that, that are involved um, are, 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 um, live up to your expectations. They can exceed them. They can, they can vary in certain ways, but they, they can't ever literally betray you, the player. So, we, want to, so we, we take great pains to establish early on that you can have perfect confidence that the right things will happen. One of the rules that I should write up for the 400 rules, this is an absolute rule for my studio, for all of my studios, never thwart player expectation. Yep. That's, 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 that's a good the one. key. Write that into us and we'll uh, send us that. our email and okay. we'll, absolutely. Doug Church will never speak to me again. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I, I can't talk about it too much, but that's very similar to, to an approach that we're taking Good. to conversation. There's there's one little twist that I really may have to steal from you, so we'll have to talk over, over right, dinner right, or right. something. But um, I, I think that that really does sound like a wonderful approach. I think this is great. It, it, now, the odd really thing cool. is about this is that um, when you're playing the, the game, uh, or in any uh, adventure game, or an action adventure game, or even an RPG where, where you know certain low grade puzzling is going to happen. Is that you feel very confident when you're actually doing um, gadget puzzles? You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm building this little thing which turns out to be a drill, and I can go through the ice, and then I can find the little amulet that's inside the ice. Oh my God, this is great! I didn't have to boil the water after all, and you know, whatever it is that that you're doing, and you always feel good about those kinds of puzzles. And then everybody, me included, when it comes to the dialogue stuff, you just sort of shrink. Oh God, I got to talk to this guy again. <laughs> it's like you got, it's like the tar baby grabbed you, and you can't get your hands off. And this changes it. This, this way, you approach people exactly the way you would approach a gadget. And one of the things, the, the other consequence of this sort of uh, style is, although we are making some exceptions, uh, we have a sort of seduction technique which is purely internal. Any dialogue which just means following various choices with other choices is, no, is, is literally a maze. It has the same status in life as a maze. You're just finding your way. And so we do as little of that as possible, and instead, almost all the dialogue in our game has to do with, uh, in effect, to be very crude about it, locks and keys. To, to, to advance your case with person A, you must have something from either person B, a conversation produced a token, 
Now you can unlock this guy with that token, or you have items that can do the same thing. Anyway, you can also combine tokens. You can combine ideas. How's the weather? How's Paris? How's the weather in Paris? You can, um, you can um, uh, you know, obviously do assembly puzzles in your inventory with tokens where you so build things. As, as much as you want to answer a question about a game that hasn't shipped yet. Uh, May not ship. We'll talk about that too if you want. <laughs> do you, one of the things that, that kind of drives me crazy about conversation systems, and, and I think particularly in adventure games, but, but even in RPGs, is that um, there's, there's never any real consequence for making a choice. It's just right. they, 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 right, right. they want you to make a choice. Is, is there any, do you ever do anything like if you give your token, your conversational token to, to non-player character A, you can't give that token to non-player character B, and therefore your path through the game, you, you get different information and your path is going to change? I have to be honest. And this is, this is where the, um, the rubber meets the road. I would like to do the very things you're talking about. I love all that stuff, and we can't really do it very much in this game. The, we, there just isn't enough time and money to get that done. It's heavy scripting. Yep. It's heavy alternative. Whenever you have to build alternative scenarios, somebody's hours got poured into that, whether it's an artist or whether it's a scripter or whether it's a, a programmer or, what, or me, the writer. And we only have so much money, and it just we can't handle it. it it's someday, we'll have expert systems, and we'll have speech and text production, and we don't have to worry <laughs> about it anymore. And someday. I just can't wait. Someday. So. Um, okay, I'm I'm torn here because there are two or three more things I want to talk to you about, but we're we're getting to the point where if I don't let you talk, we're not going to talk. So why don't I talk a little bit, and then we'll talk some more? That? Because I'm you gonna I'm just going to show you a few things here. Over to you. So I'm going to move out of the way so I can see this. Um, ah, a lot of this has sort of emerged in the Q&A, but I thought I would do it anyway. Um, I'm going to do Lord. a slight, tiny little presentation here, I hope. Can you mute my mic if you haven't already? Sure, yeah. This is um, a version of my website. There I am lurking behind all these little screenshots of games that I've done. And you can go and find me online, but what I thought we would do is um, a kind of a version of talks that I like to talk about. So this is kind of my take on the world of games. If you look at a person's code, sometimes if you look at art direction, sometimes um, it could be um, design ideas or maybe production plans, uh, you'll, you'll come across this phrase. Well, that's a reasonable way to do that. And people think they're being very polite. This is something you see mostly in code. And that's, this is probably because someone has figured out a way to load, do a loader, an image loader, so that you've got a nice loading system. And someone looks at it, and it came from another project. And you're looking at it, and you say, well, that's a reasonable way to do that loader. Because the truth is, secretly, what it means in real life is, I would never, ever do that. Because what a crufty piece of crap that code is. Well. This, 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 we can use this, this, this thing in our biz as a lens to kind of focus on several different ideas. And one of the ideas is the stubbornness of our business. We're very insula insulated. A lot of us came out of computer backgrounds. A lot of us come out of the visual arts. Uh, very few of us come out of the kind of the world of writing that is, in, is common and, and the world of directing and the theater and so forth, which uh, prevails in a lot of other forms. And uh, so we don't often voluntarily borrow things. And I, I think that's a terrible mistake. Not only that, but this kind of is a summary of a, of a common production problem, which is that we always are inventing the wheel again and again and again, even when it's perfectly suitable wheels are already out there. If you're doing, um, you know, first-person shooters these days, just use Unreal, you know, or go get Crytek stuff and use that, you know, just what are you doing? And um, so forth. And I hope that will continue. So it, it, it allows us to focus on the idea of, of production difficulties. It um, reveals a certain aesthetic that we have. Um, almost all the other um, creative and uh, fields that there are, whether it's engineering, you know, trying to figure out how to get a bridge to stand up, or architecture, what, what sort of circulation in a building would be a good system for, for a nice house. Um, people are very quick 
to look for other um, uh, arts and, and allied fields to help them. We're not, and I think this is a problem for us. Just so you know, I'm a big believer in narrative. This, uh, this debate, debate never goes away at GDC every year. There are practically fist fights, and, and uh, of, you just can't tell stories in games. Well, um, you know, it's kind of like in uh, um, the, the movie, um, the first one, uh, War of the Worlds, where Gene Barry is down in the foxhole and uh, the, 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 the agitated um, military commander looking at these ships out there says, you know, they come down and, and, and one, and then magnetically they, they come together and they, then they form threes and then they sweep through. Tell me, doctor, is that possible? And the scientist, Gene Berry, says, well, if they do it, it is. And, uh, you know, it's impossible, but we do it. So I, th I don't think we should worry too much. And just so you know, I think it's worthwhile parsing out what's, what narrative means. There are, there are th in my mind, three th sort of distinct kinds. There are chronicles. That's the sort of thing that happens in Worlds of Warcraft, or, um, or for that matter, um, almost any online uh, 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 group game. And, um, and for that matter, to some degree, in a game like Vice City, um, where you're kind of telling your own story. And the events that the history, the virtual history of your progress through a game seems like a story, in the same sense that you know, the chronicle of the, you know, the King of England would seem like a real story. And then beyond that, there are, there are mission games. And mission games, in my mind, are those, those games where there is an explicit purpose, or in a movie like The Guns of Navarone, there's a specific goal. But that goal doesn't originate inside the head of one of your main characters. It is assigned. So there is no character who is making a dramatic choice. And finally, there are full bloated stories where the, um, the whole set of events is propelled by uh, the choice that's made by one of the characters. In recent years, um, uh, a wonderful game that's unfortunately was not a big hit, but it's just really good, called Eco, is a perfect example of this, where you know, this little kid who's um, kind of trapped in a, in a, in a funeral um, pavilion, and he's about 10 years old, and there's this young woman, who, a girl who's still about 11 years old, trapped in a cage, and he says, I, I will get you out of this, princess. And the rest, of this, the rest of the game is about that. The entire game is a rescue. So um, I think it's also worth noting that all the arts are individual. They all have their own characteristics. They all have their own unique features. And you must develop expertise in, in anyone to be successful. But they overlap. And there are a lot of things that we, I think we can learn in our business from the other arts, whether it's um, architecture, if you're doing level design, or whether it's um, books, if you're just trying to tell stories, or uh, for that matter, um, uh, just the expertise that people have about particular phases of, of life. If you're directing a movie and you have to do gunplay, um, I, I actually have you know, fired weapons quite a bit, so I know what to do. But I certainly wouldn't stand on the set um, and tell my actors how to hold um, their weapon, how to get into combat uh, crouch. I would hire an expert, a wrangler, who would come in and do that for me. And he would show that you, you don't do this anymore, it's this, and here's how you get yourself positioned, and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's an important thing, because we would be a yard ahead if we would just look for expertise and make use of it. Um, as we've discussed at length, I'm just going to go by this very quickly. Um, I'm a big believer in, in rules of thumb. The practicalities of, the, of, the, of, of production and the practicalities of design supersede any theory that you can have. Um, here's something you're going to hear about. You guys are all going to go out in the world and maybe get jobs. And you're going you're to come across this cliche, there is no I in team. Well, you mostly hear this in teams like the military or football. And both of those teams, let's examine them. I think the military has ranks. <laughs> there are generals and, and privates and majors and, and, and so on. And football teams have coaches. And they have quarterbacks. They have linebackers. They have offensive coordinators. And wideouts are different from uh, tight ends. Well, most of the teams that actually get anywhere are very highly structured. And we are a little bit of an exception to that. Um, a friend of mine, Lee Sheldon, makes a, a distinction between orchestras, which have conductors, and rock bands, which don't. 
Um, I'm a freelancer these days, and I, I hire out my services to various companies. And the very hardest thing it is for me to do, it's always the toughest part of any job, is to sit with the group that's hiring me and try to understand who's in charge and what the hell they want from me. Um, so watch out for this. Um, I think it's important to make little games. I'm going to show you just a few here. Um, I know you guys in this course, you can't really um, just sit down and do a lot of programming because it's just not possible. I suppose it would be possible for the course to be arranged around you know, some engine that you know has got a good editor and you can do mods all, all semester. That's probably not a great idea. But I think that on your own, you guys, uh, if you really want to get ahead, you ought to sit down and build some games. Because one of my rules is to make your material talk to you. And the paper isn't necessarily going to talk back in the same way that an actual thing will. Because you aren't going to invest as much effort. You're going to probably be involved with a few other people. Uh, and who knows who's got what responsibility and how much you actually do. And how much when the hard decisions have to be made, you feel that in your, in your um, heart as to what, what, to, what to do. It will help you learn your craft. And it will also teach you whether or not you have what it takes. I mean, you're going to measure yourself. It's, a, it's always hard to do a game, whether it's a tiny, tiny little flash game or some huge game. And not all of it's fun. Most of it is what I think of as joyful labor. But it isn't always fun. And so you need to find out whether or not, when it's not fun, are you still interested? Or would you rather go write databases and uh, go and uh, do graphic design? Anyway, maybe we'll look at a few of these things. Um, just, um, just in case you guys want to find out more about me, you can find me at finitearts.com, halbarwood.com. They both go to the same place. So let's put that aside and look at a trailer from my last game because it's um, essentially a commercial flop. I'm very fond of this game. It's a PS2 game, and, uh, but it didn't sell too many copies. Let's see if it comes up on the right screen here. Yeah. Oh, no. Hey. This decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. you'll ever see of that game, probably. <laughs> Let's get off the screen for now. I'm going to um, show you, uh, if you don't mind, a couple of small games. Let me show you a prototype. This is actually part of Matahari. Um, this is not art. It won't look quite like this, but this is a little Flash app that I whipped together. It's based on, have you guys ever heard of Scramble Squares? It's a it's a it's a it's a puzzle where you, you edges have to match up and you can and it turns out that with these nine little squares, which can be moved like this or rotated. So we have a very simple interface. Um, if we allow edges to be like this, which we don't in this game, there are 23 billion ways you can put this nine square thing together. So it's, it's explosive. Um, the version we've got here, I think, is down to around um, 3 billion. So there's a lot of combinations. And the idea is to try to tap the telephone. When you first see this, there's a wire connecting in and out. And what you want to do is connect up. You've got a little phone uh, you, you, you get in the game. And you plug into the auxiliary socket. Now the question is, can you kind of connect it up? So 
And it turns out there's about four solutions to this. I'll just show one. Uh, if I can remember this. The idea is that it only works if you get everything connected to something. Did I do it? No, what have I done wrong? I know what. Ah, oh, God. <laughs> I screwed up. All right. Ah. Hmm. Nope, I screwed up. The hell with it. <laughs> um, wait a sec. Here's the solution right over here. <laughs> there you go. Yay! <laughs> we did it. All right. It's just enough of a puzzle um, to be intriguing. Like a lot of puzzles that are patterny puzzles and involve uh, spatial manipulation, Rubik's Cube being the most profound. Um, these are great puzzles because they're evergreen. You can, you can do this puzzle, and five minutes after you did it, you can't remember what the hell you did, and you have to do it all over again. So that's good. We use it a couple of times in our game uh, under different clothing. Um, but it helps to be able to turn these things into actual use. If you just sit there and do the paper, you're not sure. Does it work? You're not sure if it's, if it's difficult enough because you can't correspond to real time well enough. And if you just build a little prototype that actually does something, it, it will work. I'd like to show you... Um, my old Apple II game. These, this is sort of a, um, let's see if I can get this to go. Uh, okay, got to do a little bit of manipulation. This doesn't start. Here we have, I'm running Vista, and, um, and yet my old Apple II lives on. It's amazing. So I'll show you. I, now, it's funny because I thought, when I did this, I thought I actually had invented something. It turns out everybody invented it. It's called the cutscene. So here, here, here it is. Uh, 1981, really, is when this all started to happen. Eventually, I didn't really finish with it until 86. Actually, I'll put a disc in, and we'll just try very briefly um, to see what it looks like to actually play. Um, and we actually will press a key. So you can move around using the keypad. This guy, that guy's trouble. I got to get the hell out of his way. Oh, damn. This door is just open and closed randomly. Luckily, he's not too smart, although very deadly if he hits me. Um, this pile of debris is a, something I killed earlier. If I search it, I'll get a little something. It's kind of like an RPG idea. I got a little battery thing out of there. I need power cells to bribe um, some of the people I'm dealing with. Here's my little, the blue squares are local transportation, and the, um, the red squares, or orange squares, there was no red on an Apple II get you to various other levels. So here I am with a bunch of lockers, and I can, um, I can um, look at them, see what's in there. Every now and then there's secret wonderful things. I managed to get the frame rate up. I rewrote this thing about uh, the display system, um, I don't know, five or six times, and eventually keys are commodities. They just get used up. I relock the door then. Uh-oh, bad guy. Wah! Help, help, help. <laughs> damn, damn, damn. <laughs> oh, crap. Ah! It's hard to shoot. 
I'm going to be, he's not going to kill me because I've got tons of, of stuff. In fact, I got almost everything I need. But anyway, oh, and, and uh, these little guys, uh, you can talk to them. Some of the robot guys on this ship are um, Q. Where are you? And some of them have little clues. Some of them have nonsense. And some of them actually um, allow, uh, will, will give you information. Oh, damn it. Get away. Help, help, help. Quick. Quit while you're ahead. Anyway, 6502 assembly language from long ago. My ship games that didn't look that good, by the way. Me too. <laughs> I'm going to show you one more. Um, actually, I'm going to show you a little bit of Yoda stories. But um, yeah, let's do that next. <laughs> I'm not near it. Okay. This is Yoda stories. Oh, wait. Let's do this again. It's more fun. Hey. Good God. <laughs> Whoa. Oh. The dialogue box is on my other screen. Sorry. It's not a crash. I'm actually amazed that this thing even plays on Vista. <laughs> um, you, can walk, you can talk to R2. R2 is your little spirit guide, which he tells you. And you pick him up, pick up blinking things. And then I can, it's like, for example, if I grab him and I stick him on the ship, he'll tell me what to do and how to take off and primitive stuff like that. Let's go walk up here through the little tiley woods and see if Yoda's lurking around. Yep, there he is. Whoa, stop. So we just go bump into Yoga and we, Yoda, and we're starting to talk to him. And, uh, OK, what does he tell you? Tireless of the minions of the emperor. Hmm, what is he saying? OK, so we got to go to this um, forest world and uh, find the station and destroy it. Someone has actually played this game years ago. And I get this little device. Like This is the beginning of one of the two puzzle chains. And I just wind up getting a whole bunch of stuff. Eventually, I'll get, uh, when I go back, um, uh, let's go see where I land on the little forest planet. Whoa, come here. Sorry. Jeez. Let's do it this way. And um, here I am with, oh, don't go there. Um, there's lots of little strange, oh, crap. Ah, sorry, my cursor's going nuts. Anyway, um, this particular story is going to take place here. If I wander around this immediate zone, I will eventually get what's called a locator. That's the very first thing I can get. It's always guaranteed to be in the first ring around my central area as I start. Once I have the locator, I can click on the locator, and I get a map, which shows me which puzzles I've solved, which zones I've been to, which ones I haven't, and so forth. Um, this is actually just a really wonderful little game. It's, a, it's sort of an RPG. Um, <laughs> go, Luke. <laughs> Turn off. Oh, leave Yoda stories? Yes. And finally, I'm going to show you another little game. Um, and once I start showing it, I, I'll, I'll have to sort of restart it. Whoops, come on. OK. This is a game um, called Snow Cruiser. And it's a holiday card that I made for some friends. Um, Santa is driving a snowmobile, and uh, he's collecting presents instead of giving them. <laughs> so I just you know, shipped off this little Flash app to my pals, and it was fun. And it, I guess I spent maybe a couple of weeks working on this thing. But what really got me was that I originally came up with the, the notion 
of, um, of this game. And it was just a simple tracking thing. Like you see in those little race car games that you find um, when you're, uh, uh, you know, in, a, in a, a, a stationary store and they have little games on the ends of pens, that sort of thing. Or you go to Toys R Us and there's a little handheld sequence. So it's just, it's just a tracking me mechanic. But of course, that is the very same mechanic that is um, uh, done by um, Guitar Hero, a huge hit. And I found, as I tried to do it, that I just ran into huge design problems in this tiny little game. And what they are is partly because a lot of it is just miserable. You're just hitting these damn barriers. And, <laughs> and not only that, but you can see that my score is down. And how would I ever survive? It's so easy to hit the barriers. I'm never going to win. Oh, damn. You know, it's going to be terrible. And sure enough, I lost. Well, um, so the first thing you have to worry about is the misery factor. And that's one of the design problems that came up. But the other problem is that when I first got going, I just had it so that you could do the basics that you need to do, which is he was on the left edge of the screen where you'd see a lot of stuff, and um, you'd go up and down on the left. And th this worked for while I was developing it, because while I was developing it, my avatar was a little red rectangle. And it was just this little abstract thing. And I thought, what the hell? Sure, fine. As soon as I made the little Santa with his little snowmobile, and he's got his little beard flapping and all that stuff, and the treads are going, suddenly he became a real avatar. And it felt enormously constricting that I could only go up and down. I wanted to go left and right. So OK, so now I put a little bit of left and right in. But I didn't want to go too far, because you can't see what's happening over there. And you'll just get killed. Well, then, then, then I, it still felt terrible. So then I thought, OK, I'm going to let him go all the way over. And I did. And now I've got an avatar that feels good, that I can actually I like well enough so that I'll accept the challenge of the game. And I'll stay in contact with the game. And I'll work on being good at the game. But the problem was, it's useless. There's no play mechanic that justifies this. What am I going to do? Oh my god, suddenly I'm making this little Christmas card, and I'm in deep. And um, so, OK, I know what I'll do. I'll speed up. As I go across, it speeds up. And as you go back, it slows down. So OK, I'm going faster. So if just by happenstance I'm really good at the game, I can speed up a little bit, and I can do everything a little bit faster. But there's a negative feedback thing that I needed to introduce, because as you, as you go faster, you just get killed more easily. Ah, I know what to do. So to solve this problem, to unify the mechanic with a little bit of the character, what I did was I had it be slower to move between the tracks on the left. So you, if, you, if you're willing to go slow, that's great. But you have to anticipate a little bit more, because he's not as responsive. And as you move, there's a gradation, there's a constant gradation. As you move across the screen, he moves much more quickly between the tracks. So there's an advantage to being able to, to take a chance on being able to go faster. Let's, uh, let's look at this again. Let's go again. Uh, no, no, no. Here we go. OK, I'm going to, um, this time we'll do, um, here we are. So over here, it still looks pretty fast. But if I go over here, you can see it's much faster. Much faster than the difference in speed that I'm seeing. You change the sound, too. Right? The sound is really yeah, the sound goes up and down. And the little speedo goes up and down, too. Flash is wonderful. You can do it in five minutes. <laughs> now, the other thing that's going on in here is, OK, we've, in addition to having this mechanic, I have to meter stuff. So how many times am I getting hit? What's it doing to my health, which is the arc on the right? And oh, damn, I'm almost dead. Um, OK, so the problem with this of just getting hammered all the time, ah, crap is that um, it's miserable. So I thought, you know, and I don't feel very, I, I feel kind of like um, I'm the patient in the hospital, and I've got that little robe on with my butt flapping out the back. <laughs> and I don't feel so good about this, so I want to change that. And I thought, let's turn this guy into a positive hero. So among the things coming toward you aren't just terrible things, and, and, and the only good thing is the presence. No, let's have weapons. Now we'll give you a weapon, and you can now, the interesting thing about this, it makes you feel better. So you feel better about your character, because you can collect snowballs. We'll do it. So let's see if I can get a few. Hey, there's one. And now, instead of just um, dodging and try to get these things, oh, missed. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> OK, take that. <laughs> so now I feel emboldened. And 
That other thing you just saw go by, those aren't those are pretty rare, so. Whoop. Oh, I knocked out a present. Damn. You can still have pitfalls. Okay. I'm gonna get killed again here. Okay, now I'm well equipped. You can see that I've got a meter here telling me how I'm doing, so I can tell. It turns out there's a strategy to this game. You need to kind of save your snowballs toward the, till toward the end when you're going fast. Because there, is, there are two other factors in the design here which have to be accounted for. I'm going to get killed again on purpose. Um, so now you feel more positive. You've got, you've got, you've, you, you know, I've got this other weapon, but I'm still miserable because when I see my health go down, I'm screwed. I, even, I just know from having played the game more than once, it's, a, it's one of those replayable games, which is just a contest. And, oh crap, whenever I'm down to just two hits left, I never make it to the end. What am I going to do? Well, I added another thing, which is a power-up, which is the little gear that goes by that restores your health, one, one notch each. So you have a chance, even if you're taking some knocks, if you can just hang in there, maybe one of these will go by and you can come back. So it, it helps keep you in the game. Now, the other thing that's going on is how do you get to the end? And what is the end anyway? What is it, what's this all about? Well, you can see that we're starting to write the word happy something. And there's little gray circles in there. And you realize that, oh, I'll be at the end when I've finally written happy holidays. So you're assembling something. So there's a kind of a faint narrative here, which is, you know, assemble this greeting. That's what you're getting to do. You, the player, are actually assembling the greeting. And, OK. What, what this is good for is that it's a different kind of meter. We have the meters that show your speed, and the meter that shows how much ammo you've got, and the meter that shows your health. But we also have a meter for your mind, which is to lay out visually how, how you're doing in the game. You can see your progress like a progress bar. Uh, my friend Ken Rolston um, talks about stories and games. He says the, the best story is the rod of eight pieces. And the reason for that is that if you've got three of the pieces, you know you're three of the eighths of the way through. If you've got seven eighths of the pieces, you know you're almost to the end. And this is, a, this is another technique to keep you involved. It also, games are confusing by nature. If you allow a player to have freedom in the world you create, even if it's just the limited freedom of which track to choose, now he doesn't know exactly what's going to work. If you, if you watch an Indiana Jones movie, you don't really have to understand the movie very well because Indiana Jones, whether you understand his problems or not, is going to come out at the end with his hat on and, and live through it. But if you're in a game, you must understand what's going on and, and be able to respond to it in a, in a positive and effective way. And you need to know a lot of information. So one of the things you get to know is, how am I doing? How, how, how you know, uh oh, I got killed. Well, I got killed a little bit more than halfway through. That's pretty good. So I could start again and with some confidence. And there's one final little point about all this, which I'm going to go again with. Um, I'll exaggerate it. I'm doing a little. Every time I get one of these now, it's going to speed up. And I'm doing this because of Mahai Chiksent Mahai. How many of you guys have read the book Flow? OK. Essential reading. Got to read it. It's a great book. He's the guy who found out that you can quantify happiness. You can find out what it is to be happy. And you can engineer it. And notice I'm going faster and faster. This is getting harder and harder and harder. So I better resort to my, um, my, ooh, oh, damn. <laughs> hey, I won that one. OK, we're enough of this. But the point is, it got faster and faster and faster. That's because of flow. The idea of flow is that you're happiest the optimal psychology is when you are so deeply engrossed in something that you lose your sense of self. This is what people report. He invented an experimental method called, uh, I forget, ESM, uh, uh, ex experimental sampling method, where he gave people little notebooks and they had pagers. And the pagers were hooked up to a computer and randomly, for each of these people participating in the study, it would, it would page them and they wrote down what they were doing and what they felt. And then he assembled all this material. And what he found was that um, the psychology of optimal experience is that your, people reported they were happiest when they were working hard on some ta defined task. And they were, they were so engaged, they lost sense of self and they lost all sense of time. That's flow. 
Now the problem is that games are an education. So as I play the game, I learn. And the result is the challenge diminishes. So here's, the, here, here's, here's intensity and here's time. And in the middle is an, an increase on that, kind of an arrow going like that. And if it increases too quickly, I get frustrated because I can't cope with the, 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 the increasing difficulty. And I, I crash out of the game that way. On the other hand, if it doesn't increase at all, I learn too much and I get bored and I crash out of the game for that reason. So one of the things you have to always do in a design is to build in this, this whole complex system of power-ups and uh, additional material that, that people can start thinking about and, and to learn to master. And, and you have to up the challenge. The challenge has to spiral upward. Anyway, that's it. That's my wrap. Copies of this little game are available <laughs> for free. As is Yoda stories, by the way. If people with thumb drives, I'm happy to give them off. That's it. I want to be on your uh, Christmas card list. <laughs> yeah, there's another one coming. There's a couple more. So uh, it's actually 10 to 8. Uh, I think the rest of my questions are history. Uh, why don't we turn the lights on and see if there are any questions from the class? This is standard repeat the question as part of your answer time. I, they always tell me to do that, and I'm terrible. I'll I will do my best. I'll do it for you. Don't worry about it. No, you're going to do it? That? I'm going to do it. Okay. Oh, good. Sir. Um, I was curious what you guys think about the new dialogue system Mass Effect, or Bioware's trying out, um, well, the emotional responses, and the little sort of summary stuff you guys were talking about. Is this, is this Mass Effect, or is this? Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen Mass Effect. Uh, I, I, my experience with Bioware, I'm not a big RPG guy, but I liked, I played both KOTOR and uh, um, Jade Empire. Uh, I just thought, KOTOR, uh, it got Game of the Year and everyone loves it, but I hated it. I just thought it was very, very clunky, uh, very abstract. And, and, and Jade Empire is uh, several notches better. I, I like Jade Empire a lot, except I'm not big on the, the foo stuff. So um, I, I just, the idea that every single thing you do, oh, we have this problem. It's like a soap opera. You know, it's like one damn thing after another. You just, oh, no, he doesn't like me today. He's grumpy, so let's go to the ring and fight it out. You know, I mean, it, that seems completely divorced from purpose, so I, I don't go for things like that. Um, the dialogue system they used there was just totally st standard. Pick the, pick the choice and do it. So I, I'm very, very curious to see Mass Effect. I haven't seen it yet. Sorry, can't answer it. What, what I've seen briefly, because the, the spotlight should be on him, not on me, is uh, it, it's a, an interesting uh, t take on things. I mean, they're trying to make... Uh, conversation as action oriented and as, and as exciting and as visceral as, uh, uh, and as, as time constrained as, as the you know, sort of exploration and combat. And again, it's very, very interesting. Follow up answer. Um, you asked, uh, you know, what the, the emotional content thing. I, I'm very leery personally of emotion or, uh, or ethical ideas because um, ethics and emotion are extremely deep and they're complex and most of the time when we're writing things or, or, or entertained by these factors of hu human psychology, um, it, it's, it's a pretty suave experience that we're having and it's hard to get that to work in a game. So for example, you take the game Fable. And I've forgotten where this happened, but somewhere it's pretty near the beginning, you're running around this little village that looks like it came out of Dragon Slayer and you find out that somebody you know has been unfaithful to someone else, and the and and Fable decides, you know, uh, uh, Peter decided that uh, it was a good idea that um, you should inform the person that this this act of uh, betrayal had occurred. That was the good thing to do. And if you didn't do that, you were the, on the evil side. I ask you, was that the good thing to do? It's really hard to tell. And it, and when I see a crude representation of morality like that, it just blows me right out of the game. So I have a lot of trouble with that stuff. And I, I never do anything like that in my dialogue systems. I, I just I think you have to let the player you know, feel for himself what's going on. You've actually said that, uh, I don't know the exact quote, but deep characters are less important than environment in games, which kind of surprised me a little bit. Well, I mean, deep characters are nice, but it's very hard to, the deeper the character, the more awkward it gets in a game, I think. If games thrive on fairly simple stories, as I'm learning, as I crank out hundreds of pages of dialogue <laughs> on my latest one. Um, uh, I think that my take on what character is in a game is that character is, it's, it's wrong to think of character as, as Hamlet. 
you know, this, this guy who we were all curious as to why he's so torn about getting rid of the usurping king, right? That, that's, the, that's the deep psychological thing that keeps us in that, in that play. And um, that's not the kind of character we have in games. In games, we have the character we have is Spider-Man's web. That's character. You know, he can, he can skyhook. That, that, that's character as far as the game is concerned. Uh, Indiana Jones is a good example because uh, I've done a lot of that stuff. There's like three or four characteristics. One of the things is have good credentials. If you're going to be in a story, it's a big important part in a game in, to have character which places you in the action. So that Indiana Jones is a professor. He speaks 12 languages. He goes on archaeological digs. He's perfectly positioned to go after treasures and you know, hobnob it up with evil, uh, evil Nazis. Um, but he also has you know, his fist and his pistol and his whip. And that's the important functional thing that Indy's got when it comes to a game. It's not whether he in internally is you know, greedy or, or, or righteous or idealistic. It's just whether he can whack you and take your weapon away by cracking his whip. So that, I guess that's what I really mean there. And I think the other thing that's going on is that in a, in a, in a movie, uh, a good example of this is uh, The Mountain. Uh, Spencer Tracy and uh, uh, one of the guys sitting at Dr. Evil's table. Who is that guy? A anyway. Um, <laughs> um, are these two mountain climbers, and it's, uh, there's a plane wreck up in the mountains, and uh, th these two guys go up, and when they get up there, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's all this sports tension as they're climbing the sheer face of the, the Iger. Wagner. Pardon? Robert Wagner. Robert Wagner. Hey. Okay, so Robert Wagner and Spencer Film Tracy. Film geek. Used to uh, find the mistakes in Film Goer's Companion. Thank you very right. much. Okay. okay. Well, all right. So you're going up there. You're going up the mountain, and it's really hard, and you're putting your pitons in, and the music is, you know, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. That's, you call that sports tension. But the actual, the, the, the director's smart. He knows you can't get away with that in a movie. So what he's really going on is when you get up there to the airplane, you find there's a treasure on board. And there's one survivor. Now, are we going to let that person die and take the money and, hey, we're rich? Or are we going to bring the person back? In which case, she will know that the treasure has to be delivered to the, the rightful owners. There's a big conflict between the two of them. And so the, the dynamic of the movie is one wants to, to, to take the money and run, and the other one wants to, no, no, we've got we to save the person. And uh, the point of this is that in a, in a movie, in drama in general, the environment means almost nothing. You can't make it exciting. There is no such, the, 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 you know, the environment it cannot be the villain. It's just a condition. However, we all know that in a game, my god, it might be really cool to be pitoning your way up that damn mountainside and the hell with the, the, the ethical dilemma on the other part of it. You know, that might be a really good game. So. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, there's a big difference. You're killing me. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> yep. You briefly mentioned that Matahari might not ship. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, Warren and I talked about that a little bit. Here's what's going on. The game is being made on a shoestring. Uh, the publisher over there is, is, I think, very solid. It's called DTP Entertainment. They're based in Hamburg. Uh, in, in, uh, in Germany, they... Um, they publish under a, a brand of theirs called Anaconda, but that doesn't really work for venture games over here. I think their partner in America, uh, or at least in North America, because they're from Canada, is Dreamcatcher. Um, but they're, they're a solid company. But they're, 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 Germany's full of tiny little studios. And um, the studio, I think, that's building our game is, their nose is, here's the surface of the water, and it's kind of like this, and I, you know, I can't tell. Uh, the, we've been working on the game now for the better part of a year, almost a year. The anniversary is in a week or two. And they made a lot of progress, but I'm not convinced absolutely that they'll see it through to the end. So, I don't know. We'll find out. About a, about a year and a half now, I think. I don't think it'll be done in six months. I think it'll be another year before they get it out the door. So we'll see. And the problem is that they're, 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 they're falling behind a little bit. So now you have, as a publisher, a big problem. You've got a lot of games that you publish. And the question is, um, are you going to let another game go intrude in someone else's slot as, as it's delayed? Or does it make more s and possibly diminish the value of another game, which is trying to come out maybe like next fall? And maybe our game would come in there and diminish the value of that game without actually taking over that slot, in which case they've really made a bad decision from a business point of view. Or is it better to, hey, the writing's on the wall and see ya? kill it. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, every week, emails come and go, and my mood goes like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty much the game business, by the way. This right here. Mm. Any other questions? Yep. The, the game business is pretty secretive, often. Um, how do you share technologies and ideas with other people? 
This is a great question. It's a, a big problem. How do we share technology in a, in a business that's secretive? It is secretive. It's secretive because we're organized into companies. And companies are run by foolish people who want to protect all these little assets that are semi-worthless. And, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you can always run out there and find other stuff. I mean, in, in fact, if you're smart, you, you do as little software as possible, I think. But um, there are always people out there who think they've got the next greatest thing and they want to protect it and they don't want to tell anybody about it. Th this happened at LucasArts many years ago with a sound, uh, uh, interactive sound system called iMuse. Everybody does interactive sound now. I mean, iMuse never made a dime for the company, but they wouldn't tell anybody what we were doing. We were forbidden to explain to people how we were able to hook sounds in dynamically. And, you know, the next thing we knew, Wing Commander came out, and they were doing it too. And, and you know, geez. So I, I just think it's foolish. And here's the interesting thing. Again, I, I'm doing a lot of analogies to the movie business because I've worked for long periods of time in both businesses. And uh, so they, they really differ. Let's say you're doing a, 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 fi a, a fictional um, a feature motion picture that happens to involve football or baseball. And so you're the director of photography and you want to cover it with a sky cam. You see them all the time on the other cameras in pro football games now, these, these cameras that float on wires. And there's a computer that's, someone's got a joystick and a computer's reeling in wire here and there as the thing zooms around and it can figure all the equations of how much wire gets reeled in to make it go up and down and left and right and around, right? Well, okay. There, so now the first DP who does this finds out that those wires are very springy. So he's got a frame that's going dung -a dung -a dung -a when he's trying to do his tight shot. And oh my god, there goes a day. And so he figures out, OK, here's the first thing you do. Don't get too close. Don't move too fast. Make sure you use the widest angle lens you can possibly use so the frame line moves as little as possible against the image. That's a trick you know. And he'll learn all these things the hard way the first time. And everybody will be gr gr gritting their teeth. But he will leave at the end of that production. He doesn't work for that company. Everybody just gathers to make a movie, and then he'll go off and work on another movie. And he'll tell his grips, and he'll tell his loaders, and he'll tell other people about what's going on. And the next guy who comes along to use a sky cam in a fiction movie knows exactly what to do, because everybody told everybody what to do. And that's wonderful. We should be doing that. And the only thing we have that's even faintly like that is GDC or GDC Austin or some of the news groups that, are, that exist. But it's very ineffective, and it needs to get changed. Otherwise, we're going to be in the dark ages forever. I think that's as good a place to end as, as we could possibly come up with. So okay. thank, thanks for coming, Hal, and uh, it was great. Th thank you very much. <clears throat> if you have other questions, you can write me at my website, hal at fineartarts.com, and I'll, I'll be happy. Tell me.